Hello out there, you fine gents and ladies. What's a, what's a medieval way to say gents and ladies? I'm not entirely sure. Today you guys are joining me on episode number 43 with Dr. Jessica Troy. She is a medievalist. Yes, there is such a thing. She takes us on a deep look into not only medieval literature, which is her specialty, the Anglo-Saxon era, mind you, somewhere between 400 and 1500 AD, but we also talk about like the day in the life of a medieval human. Uh, what would the world look like trying to go to work and say 800 or year 1100 or even 1500 AD? What types of jobs could a lowly peasant like myself expect to have? What kinds of careers, lifestyle, and entertainment could I find back then? Jessica is incredibly smart. Of course, being a teacher, she is a, uh, a teacher. She's a doctor. She's very talented at painting a picture of medieval life, specifically the parts that are about corpses and all things that are uh, um, a little darker than, than you would probably typically learn about if you went to a, a traditional school or maybe, um, you know, heard a lecture or something like that. Jessica's actually got her thesis in essentially the way she under she, the way she explained it to me and the way I understood it uh, you know in my in my non uh, doctoral mind is that essentially she has a focus on uh, corpses and medieval literature specifically anglo-saxon literature which kind of focuses in on the 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 English um, you know um, what is now the English country but of course it was called the Britons back then so this is some very eye-opening stuff I'm a big history buff um, I wouldn't say that I know a lot of stuff, but I feel like I've learned more since I talked to her and was able to connect a lot of dots about things that, um, I, I've always just kind of been into just world history. Um, and then, you know, crazy stuff like, you know, digging up dead bodies and putting them on, on, uh, you know, on the stand in court, you know, uh, the way that they would treat women, the way that, uh, food was done, the way that entertainment was had. Um, you know, we talk about Beowulf, we talk about Robin Hood, we talk about King Arthur, all the classic tales. So to me, I was enthralled the entire time. This is the longest one that I've ever done. Super proud of this thing. Jessica, thank you again for coming on. You really know your stuff. Uh, definitely would love to have you on again in the future, especially once you get your next book published. Um, and universities, consider yourselves notified that she is actually out and about trying to find a permanent position on your faculty as a medievalist. Uh, you can reach out to her at her email at jtroy01 at unm.edu. That's jtroy01 at unm.edu. And her Gmail is jtroy84 at gmail.com. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. And keep pursuing that greatness out there. So I'm here with uh, Jessica Troy. Jessica, say hello to everybody hello. out there. She is a PhD, soon to be PhD, so we can call you Dr. Troy. Thank you. In medieval studies. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I thought that you were uh, super interesting, roughly my age, uh, early 30s, and we're trying to like figure out how I couldn't do something near as cool as that with all that time that I've lived. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm in awe of somebody that can become a doctor in something so niche down as medieval times. Mm -hmm. Um, so we talked ever so lightly about kind of like what got you into where you're basically leading to as a career for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. So where did you get interested in the medieval times? So it pretty much started with me when I was in high school. Okay. Um, I had my 10th grade history class and I think it was a world history class at that point. And we started covering England, um, way back when, and I thought, Oh, medieval, this is gonna be so boring. There's just all this other crap that we don't know. And like, right. it's, it doesn't have any relationship relationship to me or right. anything like that. Everybody was just dirty back then. Everybody was dirty, right? <laughs> you still had that idea of dark ages, right? right? So here's a hint. If you get around a medievalist or anybody in that time period, do not use that phrase. We absolutely loathe it. <laughs> <laughs> medievalist? Is that what you're... Yeah, that's what we're called, is okay. medievalist. Okay, but don't use what phrase? Dark Ages. Dark Age. Okay, yes. I see what you're saying. We okay. hate the phrase Dark Ages. So so the, the verbiage is important. So Dark Ages is different than Middle Ages? Yes. Or, or so, okay, so yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, middle, middle Ages is the time period. Okay. That's what we consider uh, that particular time period between about 400 and up to 1500. Okay. Um, specifically... 400. 
yeah, 400 oh, AD. Oh, wow. Okay, AD, okay. Uh, into 1500. Wow, so that's a big span, expanse of like years. And yeah. that covers different terms that we probably use loosely, like Bronze Age and Dark Age. That's before. Bronze okay. Age would come before. Okay. Uh, it's after the Roman Roman period where they were really, really big, where their okay. empire had been built. Um, and the whole reason why what we now call England, I'm uh -huh. specifically in England. So when I hear, when you say Middle Ages for me, that means England. Okay. There are other medievalists who study the entire rest of the world sure. during their Middle Ages period. Okay. So something like in Italy, the Middle Ages of Italy was came different. slightly before the Middle Ages of England. Okay. And this is like the natural flow of humans like moving around the continents yeah. and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So you're in high school, you're you're covering right. so I'm in England high school, plague. Covering things that were that seemed really boring. And then I turn the page and I see um, an artist representation of plague and uh the black plague and um the carts that they used to collect dead people from people's wow. houses like body carts yeah body carts sounds like a metal band I'm already <laughs> <loving>. <laughs> um and they you know they rang the bell and they would say bring out your dead bring out your dead wow. um and i see that and the goth girl sentiment that I was in high school at right. a Catholic high school just right. lit up oh, and I couldn't resist. I just had to know more about what is this plague? Why are they collecting people in carts? Right. You know, it's just like feet sticking out of the carts and arms everywhere and things oh. like that. And it, it's a horrible sight. It's yeah. horribly macabre, but it was so cool to me, you know, and we have a culture now of reverence for corpses and, you know, when your loved one dies, you want to make sure that it's treated with respect and all of sure. that. Back then, nope, didn't right. matter. It was all, it they was all were utility, plague, basically. They were plague infested. They wanted to get rid of them as fast wow. as possible. Now, I mean, uh, uh, maybe a bit of a tangent here, but yeah. in a plague situation like that, if my, if, uh, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm from that era. I wouldn't know better, I guess, or, or wouldn't know any different. Would my, if my wife got the plague, mm -hmm. would I just instantly disbar her from the family, kick her out, wait for her to die kind of situation? Or were, did they try to like treat it with religion? I mean, what was this, what would you do in like a close family tie situation? I understand well, like bodies being thrown out and like, <laughs> yeah. okay, After they're random dead. people. Yeah. But. After they're dead. Um, so the plague, when it struck a family, um, generally that whole family got exiled oh, to their man. own house. Okay. Um, so depending on the, the social class that you were in though. So if you were high class, okay. um, if you were an aristocrat, if you had lots of money, um, you could probably make it through okay. uh, a lot of, a lot of high class people still died, but, um, they could afford having a physician come and try to, uh, help them through. What's a physician going to do? In the Middle Ages, you know what I mean? Like, they, the bacteria were, wasn't there. We didn't have uh, Lestier, right? Joseph Lestier, wasn't right. he one of the early ones on the bacteria wagon? Yeah, we didn't have that quite yet. Right. Um, but we did have the four humors theory okay. uh, that was proposed by Gallen way far back, even way before uh, the plague period. And so they had that idea of um, your humors being off. So different fluids in your body, if they were off, okay. that's what caused you to get sick okay. or have some kind of temperament. Um, so if you had, if you were, uh, let's say hot blooded, okay. you know, and so someone says you're hot tempered, right? You, we have that now too. Sure. If you're quick to anger, um, back in the day, they would say you, your, your blood humor was off. So you were a sanguine person. Wow. And so they had to regulate your hot blood. Okay. So generally they would say, okay, you need to eat, uh, raw fruit. Something like that. So um, in some of the stories, like Sir Gowan in The Green Knight, um, or in the round table stories, uh, Sir Gowan would be um, in, in, at the round table, and he would have a bowl of apples in front of him. And back then, it was kind of a faux pas to have raw fruit or to eat raw fruit. Um, and so he would have this bowl of why? raw apples. Why would, why would that I'm be? I'm not sure. Um, they just liked everything to be cooked. Okay. Um, or as cooked as possible. Was so that, raw was fruit was weird. Cause that was maybe seen as more common food. Yeah. Maybe? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to cool off his temperament, if he ever got, you know, all his crazed, temperament. he would, he would take a bite of an apple. Um, so they had that four humors theory. Damn this job. Damn it all. I'm so angry. <laughs> Give me that apple. That's yeah, how he does absolutely. it. Screw a beer. He does <laughs> absolutely. <an apple. laughs> well, they always had the, the ale ready to right. go. That's what they had. But, um, so they had the four humors theory and things had progressed, uh, throughout the history of medicine to this point a little bit more. Um, 
So what they thought was that if you have you ever heard of bloodletting? Yes. Okay. That's okay. what I thought this was going right. to lead to. So the okay. idea of bloodletting, um, the same idea held true for the bubonic plague. Okay. So we call it the bubonic plague because the the telltale sign of you having plague are these black buboes that are all over your body, mm. and generally it happened at your lymph node points. Buboes. Um, so this is like a big. Yeah, it's like a big uh, black. Big Scab? black uh, pus filled mm. orb on your body. And if any of you were eating when you heard that, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Middle Ages was not clean, um, not easy to eat around. Yeah. Um, oh. So these these physicians would go around and they would lance the buboes open, and they thought if we got the pus out that would mean the infection was coming out. Sure, like you would if you had like a sticker that built up in your foot or something. Right. I could see the logic. I right. could see the logic. Or, you know, sucking out the venom from a snake bite, mm. that kind of thing. Okay. Um, that sounds horrible similar too. Similar idea. <laughs> right. But um, the problem with it, okay, if you're the first patient of the day, fantastic. You have a, a decent chance of, of making it through this procedure, right. let alone the plague. Right. If you were his like eighth patient of the day, you were dead because you were getting the lanced infection from the previous seven, seven people. people. There was no hygiene. There no was washing. no infection prevention. Oh my God. He's not going to clean his instrument. Um, maybe if he was <sighs> really on it and didn't want it like all over his bag or all over his work, uh, he might clean it a little, wow. but there's no sanitizing, no disinfecting. So, so I mean, just in the, uh, uh, the, you know, even in the parlance of, of the times that were then after a year or two, five years of doing this, like, mm -hmm. did they see that anybody was getting any results with that? Like, would any, I mean, I'm guessing they would just get better for one other reason rather than another, but would yeah. some people survive from like Dr. So-and-so cutting open their sometimes, oils? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it did work. Huh. Um, a lot of, like that first patient, maybe right. the second, right, right. um, they might live, uh, pretty much it was based on your immune system. Sure. Really. If you could fight the bubonic infection, right. That was that was how you and were And then like live. the seven other dudes' blood that's now mixed into yours and yeah, all you're, that. You're done for. That's so crazy. You're done for. Well, I, but I, the bubonic plague was only one strain of okay. the plague. Okay. There were two other levels of the plague that oh. were even worse. Okay. So the bubonic plague, you had it was a seventy five to eighty percent kill rate. Damn. The next one was the pneumonic plague. Okay. Which is where everything goes into your lungs. Okay. That boosted it to about an eighty five percent kill rate. Wow. into the 90s because it because it was airborne at that point well like yeah the the infection was airborne anyway i thought it was fleas off of rats infected well, with the plague. So, that's kind of debated okay, what, where okay. it came from i feel You're bad the for the, i feel bad for the rats because they get blamed but it really wasn't the rats hey it wasn't me hey. <laughs> <laughs> they just happened to carry the fleas okay um so you had those infections from from the fleas. Um, and if they got on you, they bit you because again, no hygiene. Sure. Um, then that's how it got into you. But through your bloodstream, it might go into your lungs. If it goes into your lungs, you're less likely to die than the bubonic or uh, more likely to die than the bubonic plague. Because it's in your lungs. Because it's in your lungs wow, okay. and they can't treat that. Sure. Then the third one, pretty much the ultimate kill rate, 95% or higher is the septicemic. Okay. If it is in your blood. Okay. Just like now, really. Yeah. If something gets in your blood and it's not treated, you're going to die from so it. So that, that's where the, I mean, like septic is essentially yeah. you're just, your body's poisoned. Yep. Like you're just out. Wow. Absolutely. So three different levels of plague were identified okay. um, throughout the time period. And depending on what you had, that was going to be your mortality rate. Um, the, the lower class were hit the hardest, okay. um, lack of hygiene, lack of any kind of, um, cleanliness, anything like sure. that was just going to be your, your ultimate terminator. Wow. So the high class could survive. Um, and a lot of them didn't even get it mm -hmm. because they weren't around the rats. They weren't around the sure. fleas. They said cleaner houses because they could afford it essentially. Yeah, they okay. could afford it. And How many people do cared. you think like, like, uh, you know, cats like you and me, we're making like what would be considered middle wage maybe. Mm -hmm. How would we have lived? Would we have been able to afford a house as big as like, you know, a 1200 square foot house or no. no. Okay. So, and if we did, no. uh, would I, would I be correct in assuming that I'm going to probably have like 13, 14 people in there, like two families or something in order to, 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 to afford a, a house like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're de there's definitely going to be multiple right. um, families living together. So if one dude gets yeah. it, it's probably going to infect a whole, like, gonna couple infect families. Everyone. That's insane, man. Yeah.
So if, and if you ever go to England, um, they have these kinds of tours and I love going to the, the dungeon okay. tours, right? They call them the dungeon. And in the London dungeon tour, they have a section that's all plague. Okay. Um, and it, so it's reenactors, it's, it's actors that are reenacting what happened at that time. So, wow. and they go through history. Um, so there's like Jack the Ripper and Sweeney Todd huh. and things like that. And they're actual actors. Yeah. They're that's actors. Cool. Um, not big names, obviously, sure. but you yeah. know, people well, who are in have the Have you ever acting. been to Williamsburg in, uh, um, Virginia? No, I went to Gettysburg, but okay. not Williamsburg. Okay. And uh, did they have actors there as well? They have kind of the yeah. same. Okay. Yeah. yeah Cause I, I, I loved it. I got to go into like a store and it was like a, a general goods store. Mm -hmm. And these two actors would just improv talk to you. And I told them I was from New Mexico. <laughs> you're from, you're from Mexico where the savages are, you know, like he just totally played it off. So that's really cool. So, yeah. so, so is this like in those things where you see, you go into like a dungeon and you see the skull, the skulls and the skeletons piled high around mm -hmm. you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And those were mass graves in England from these plague they did have mass graves okay. um yeah because they just needed to get rid of them um but it, eventually they ended up burning them too because okay. the graveyards filled up sure so. and then did, did they start to understand that that those things were because like okay they don't get that washing your hands or being cleaner is what could keep you from spreading it but it seemed like they understood to burn the bodies or or seal them in earth in order to keep the the disease out that was kind of understood right i don't know if they understood it being about disease i think okay. it was more about we're running out of room Real? Um, oh, okay. and so we need to do something yeah. with these bodies we can't leave them out yeah um because they're gonna spread yeah the bob's, disease bob's getting more. crispy over there yeah it was a hot day yesterday that shit was nasty <laughs> <laughs> well, Light and they were match. used to, they were used to throughout the medieval period, um, execution victims being left out. Wow. Okay. Um, either, As like a s symbol. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They would leave them at the, the city gates, oh, man. um, by the walls. They would sure. throw them over the walls. Crucifixion. This is still happening then? Not in England. Not in England. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause this is more of like a Metro like city situation where we're not out. Kind of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cause well, I, I guess <laughs> London wasn't quite what we consider metropolitan right. quite yet. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. But we're not, uh, I guess maybe. So the, so the plague, did that come with any sort of war? Was there any sort of like, did, were they, was that being spread by any sort of war or anything like that? No. No. Okay. Um, so things were happening at the same time, okay. but they were not causal. Sure. <clears throat> okay. So, um, we were around the time of the crusades, things like that, but that was happening off of English soil. Okay. So the rats coming in from, or the fleas and rats coming in from uh, the east to the west had n very little to do with any war sure, okay. uh, or any crusades. It was more from like trade routes, okay. things like that. So it's a lazy answer to say the fleas and the rats brought the plague and stuff yeah. like that, because there's probably a lot of stuff <laughs> that either we yeah. A, didn't know, or B, just didn't like really get correct. And as yeah, in I mean, the fleas did do it, um, you know, and the, and the rats helped them along. Right. So they were, they were less infected and more just like cars for the fleas. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, so the rats get the, the bad rap. Right. Because I they think. weren't biting the humans to spread it. They were just bringing the fleas, which the fleas bit the humans. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then it was a big thing. Could I be correct in saying so that people would live in very close proximity to animals Yes. for a long time, right? Oh yeah, like definitely. You'd have them inside in cases where maybe there's weather or no room maybe, but you need a goat to make your milk, right? That's yeah. like a scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you were that kind of um, if you had that kind of occupation, right? Sure. So, I mean, there was at that time, um, so my specialty is earlier in the middle ages is okay. the Anglo-Saxon period. Right. And we're talking about the later middle ages okay. section. So okay. the, I, um, after the Norman conquest, um, the middle class rose. Okay. And preface me a bit. So yeah. Norman conquest, what time in terms of years? 1066. 1066. I like how you just write in that year. And that's the, whole bit. Give the me battle the of Hastings. Give me the month. Come on. Everyone knows. <laughs> I think it was October. Look at you. <laughs> I might be wrong. Um, and some other medieval nerds out there are probably going to correct me. Um, but definitely 1066 battle of Hastings. We call it battle of Hastings. It actually took place about like 20 miles away from Hastings, Okay. but nobody remembers that town. Sure. So it was Hastings, Hastings England. Yes. Okay. Hastings, England. Okay. okay. Uh, when, Who's fighting? Uh, so it's the English versus the Normans. Okay. And all of it had to do with the English throne and who had the better claim to the English throne. Okay. There were three contenders, okay. including um, the Norman leader. And the Norman leader, whose name is really escaping me right now. <laughs> and that's <laughs> terrible. Um, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. I'll think of it. Um, he was the one who said he had the biggest claim. Okay. Rather than the guy who was actually living in England. 
Okay. Um, and, and ruling and all of that stuff. And so they were fighting. <clears throat> the third guy didn't have quite as strong of a claim. He said that, well, this other leader told me I could have the throne after he died. Oh, wow. It's like, well, yeah, no. Yeah. And, and there wasn't <laughs> yeah, like know. a steward system where if the bloodline dies, somebody else takes over. None of that well, was see, established. That was the problem. Okay. Was that the, that current English leader didn't have an heir. Okay. And so this is why the whole of Thing English happened. throne sure. came into. It's up for grabs. He's right. going to die soon. Cool. Right. Was Who's that a cough next? I heard? I better start. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's got plague. Yeah. Um, not quite yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, um, that whole strife happened. Okay. And then of course, um, we know from history, the Normans took over, they okay. won. Um, and so the, for the first time, the English throne was not led by an English person. Wow. So what was his, what was his heritage? Scottish? Scottish? Uh, French. French. So, wow. So yeah, okay. the Normans from Normandy. Okay. Yeah. Oh, now we're on the same page. Okay. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> damn dirty French. <laughs> Kidding. They help us later. They help us later. They what, do. 17, they help us later. We're allies. All that stuff. Yeah. And we do get quite a bit um, from the Normans in our language. Okay. So that's when there's a big linguistic change okay. in our language. So that's when um, the way, what I study is Old English. Okay. And so it looks nothing like modern English. And right. it's hard to read if you don't have an actual dictionary of huh. Old English with you. After 1066, with the Norman influence, the language started changing. Okay. And so now we get Middle English, which is like Mallory and Chaucer, um, and things that you could more easily read. Um, you might be a confused on a few words here and there. They may not look right, uh, or some phrasing may not look sure. right. Um, they still had some funky um, ways of, of organizing their sentences. Sure. But overall, you could pick up Chaucer in its original form. Right. And get the basic idea sure, of, okay. okay, here's the, here's the knight's tale. What do I need to know? Yeah. Um, a lot of that influence came from the Normans. So, so we get a lot of our words from them. So a lot of French influence, mm -hmm. essentially. Okay. Yeah. A lot of and, French influence. I mean, and, and, uh, would you see like with the French, was it Latin any part of that? Like that's not, cause, cause I guess what I'm asking then, um, at this point, mm -hmm. what's the most common spoken language? Is it just straight up English, but this more hybrid English? That's being changed. So the vernacular or okay. the popular language the of the common people mm -hmm. was English. Okay. Everyone was speaking English. Sure. Once the Normans came, then they started intermingling with our our English folks. And so some of them would speak French. Okay. Um, the Normans would speak French or, sure. or a, an ancestor of modern French. And so then those people who were getting mixed with would kind of pick up on some French. Okay. And so then that kind of became like, we get like a Frenchified English, kind, kind of like, like Spanglish. Right. Or like almost. Creole, right? Like they kind of have like some of that or like in. in it's not quite a Creole okay. um, in the linguistic term okay. of a Creole. Um, there's linguistics people who would kill me if I said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was some influence, okay. uh, especially in the upper and middle class. Low class, they were still going to speak just plain old English. Right. Because it was easier. They couldn't speak French. They weren't going to learn French. They didn't <laughs> care. They got to go to work. They were worried about surviving about your French. Right. than learning some sure. other new fancy schmancy right. language. Right. They didn't care. Um, Latin, though, since you brought up Latin, uh, Latin was always considered the highest of the high. Sure. As far as language was concerned. Because the church spoke this, right? Right. Like this, the okay, okay. Church things, anything from the church came from Latin. Okay. Masses were still spoken in Latin. Right. Um, and anything that was written down was going to be in Latin. Right. Um, if it had any kind of authority, if it had any kind of uh, political or religious um, influence, it was going to be in Latin. Huh. So in order to know what that stuff said, you had to know Latin. Right. Or you had to be friends with somebody who sure. knew Latin. Sure, who could, who could it translate it, it essentially. Yeah, and, right, okay. who could read it to you. That's interesting. So there's probably like a job market for that. Oh, you know? absolutely, yeah. <laughs> translate my Bible, please. I don't and know then what the hell it says. French came in and that became um, kind of a secondary prestige language. Okay. Um, because the king was French, he okay. was Norman. Um, well, he didn't speak English. Right. So anybody who dealt with the king you better know French. Right. Or was trying to politically get in a circle or something like right. that. Okay. Yep. So you're you better either know it. Latin or French. That's interesting. So that's like one of the first like ways that you can see like global culture kind of thing mm -hmm. mixing, you know, like now there's a melting pot. I mean, air quotes everywhere because Absolutely. everybody's been everywhere now. I mean, yep. especially modern travel, you know, but it's interesting to see how that would drive 
drive an entire culture to change just without being forced upon them. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, in some cases, we, I'm sure. But. Even what we think of as England, and I'm using air quotes to say England, sure. um, that has a whole issue with it as far as what it used to be right. um, in the early Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I say England for the later Middle Ages, it had become unified by that point. So okay. it was the land of the Angles. Okay. After 1066. Sure. <clears throat> or by 1066. Right. With all the people, whoever they came from, their heritage, they're England, they're they're of this like basically. Right. They English considered culture. themselves English. Right. Okay. Before that, they were not English. England okay. didn't exist. Huh. As it was, it was a land of seven kingdoms. Like like our original 13 colonies kind of a situation. Sort of. Okay. But each one was ruled by its own king, okay. essentially. They weren't all homies. No. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them really hated each other, actually. Sure. Okay. Um, but so that happened because in the very beginning, in when we go beginning. way, way back in the beginning, <laughs> I feel biblical. Um, in the beginning, England was not England. Right. England was Britain. Okay. Okay. And who lived there were the native Bretons. Okay. Now the native Bretons were being um, basically killed off by the Romans. Um, but before that, the Romans were expanding their empire. Sure. And so uh, this big piece of land, this big island was going to be part of their conquest. Right. Um, so they came in, they took over they were ruling. We were, well, we English were Romans, right. right? We were influenced by the Romans. We had Roman roads. That's where we got a lot the of the Roman road. technology yeah. essentially. Right. Yeah. Okay. So actually it was really helpful to right. have the Romans there. <laughs> um, but the native Bretons would not have said that. Sure. Um, so this is, this is almost like a uh, uh, mirroring a later on situation where the English are invading the United States because mm -hmm. they're kind of, this is how it's going to be. I don't care if you lived here kind of situation. We yeah, did the native. Absolutely. Okay. That's you interesting. Know, I guess I never knew that as an empire. That's what they did. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, the English empire eventually took over half the world at exactly. this point. It's the Roman empire taking sure. over half okay. the world. Um, the Britons didn't like them. Okay. And, um, thankfully though, at one point, um, Rome was starting to have some issues. Okay. And so all the Romans left the whole country. Because wow. they had to take care of a problem at home. Right. Okay. Um, I think it was like the Ottomans or something like that were invading. Sure. sure. So they had to bring all their forces back. So that left the Bretons open. Right. No defenses. Sure. The Bretons were farmers. That's all they knew. Sure. England had great farmland. Still does. Right. Um, now, their northern friends friends, quote unquote, um, saw an opportunity. Okay. So they started getting invaded. Who's their Northern friends? By the Irish, the Scots and the Picts. Interesting. So they started shit first way back when. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. They yeah. were definitely starting crap. Wow. Um, so they would come down yeah. and they started invading. Okay. The Britons couldn't fight. Okay. And they said, no, we're not going to do this again. We can't have another Roman situation with right. these Northern assholes. <laughs> We're not going to do it. Sure. So out of their desperation, they called on the Germans. Wow. Who at this point were not, was not Germany. Right. Um, they called on uh, three groups called the Angles, the Jutes, and the, and, uh, the Saxons. Okay. So, and they were from their relative land. So Anglia, um, essentially Saxony and, current day Germany. Yeah. Right? Current okay. day Germany. Okay. Um, so we call them the German mercenaries. Right. They came over. This is like a mirror to the revolutionary war. That's why I'm loving this. It's amazing. Yeah, Cause they, history we, repeats the itself. The British use the German, uh, mercenaries against the U S who essentially in this case would be the Brit, the Britons. Mm -hmm. Would I have it right? Right. Mirroring. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. So they, they called him over, said, can you get these guys out of our land? Yeah. And the Germans like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. How much like, money you got? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How much money do you have? And it really did come down to amount of money, um, it, to try and get them out which didn't work. Um, <laughs> um, Remember when we said we could? Didn't work out. Sorry. Yeah. So they came over and they did. They kicked those guys out. Yeah. And they, they said, nope, this ain't your land. Get the hell out. Yeah. And so the Irish, the Scots, and the Picts all went back up north. And then they said, the Germans said, hey, slim pickings. Right. We, we're not going back to Germany. Our yeah. land sucks. Right. Like as far as fa farmland goes. Right. These guys are farmers. They can't fight us. <laughs> We're going to move in. Wow. So they moved in. There's no way the Britons were going to fight them. Right. And so the Britons got moved north and west okay. of their lands. So things like Cornwall. 
Okay. That's where they move to. And that's okay. where they still come from now. Interesting. And so now when we say uh, England and we say it's the land of the Angles. Okay. That's from the Germans who were Angles. Wow. Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. That is very interesting. So when I say I study Anglo-Saxon Germ- uh, England, I'm talking about that German influence on England. In that time period. And that's and that's essentially like where the basis of uh, the modern heritage is. Like if somebody did an ancestry test mm-hmm. and they're from England, yep. they're probably going to trace back into that pool. Yeah, they're of- going to go even further back and see, well... Was there, was there an Irish and Pict influence? Like, you know, cause there was intermingling. Sure. Not everybody hated each sure. other. Um, or was there some intermingling with these German folks, sure. you know, with the native Bretons? Right. I um, mean, everybody's making babies. I don't think yeah, everybody's point. making babies. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the Germans essentially became English right. at that point. Okay. Um, and we started, they started speaking a language, which eventually became our English. That's interesting. Where the native British language is not the same. Right. So that's where I come f- come into it. So so what is what is Welsh Welsh compared to Gaelic? What am I what are, are, am I speaking to languages that were the northern folks, the Irish and the Scottish if I have that correct? So you're talking about Wales and then you're talking about Ireland. Okay. Yeah. And am I talking about different time periods as well? See, this is something Probably. I don't know. Okay. Uh I don't do Gaelic and okay. I don't do Welsh. Okay. Um there are medievalists who do. Okay. Uh that's not me. But it was spoken <laughs> by who though? Do you know who at least spoke it? I mean, it, it So well, the um whatever the Welsh spoke, those would have been folks from Wales. Okay. Um and I get it. So it's like whatever, central to their area. And like, then Gaelic would have been spoken by the Irish. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like how we have or uh, proto-Gaelic at uh, that How we have like, you know, S- South America would have Mexico speaking Mexican and then or Mexican, sorry, excuse me, speaking Spanish, <laughs> Spanish. excuse me, the Mexican version of Spanish though. Right. Um, and then you would have uh, uh, like Brazilian speaking Portuguese maybe. And that yeah. was like a slight influence. And then you have Spain, which speaks a different type, different of, Spanish, type of Spanish, right? Like yeah. it's, it's Spain Spanish, I guess is what I was, you know. Yeah. And even in England, um, in the different kingdoms in mm-hmm. the seven kingdoms, we have slightly different variations of their old English. That's so interesting. we, I study uh, West Saxon okay. old English okay. from uh, the kingdom known as Wessex. Okay. But there's also Sussex and Essex and Bernicia and Deira. Huh. And so those all had their own separate versions of Old English that are pretty similar. Okay. You could probably work through it and okay. still get the, the idea. Um, but, you know, vowels change or the spelling might be a slightly right. different sure. that kind of thing. You got you to gotta say, and, and it's like the little things like, I'm sure like her and him, like you have between Spanish is just like ever so slight compared to the next language. Because I feel like it all mm-hmm. comes from Latin, you know, so it's all going to be kind of more or less versed the same way. Way, like a lot of languages come from Latin, right? I mean, like yeah. almost all of the main but, ones yeah. that are spoken now. You know, I mean, you've got uh, mostly a Latin influence, just the way they they structure the words and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, so you're you're interested in high school. We go through the plague. Yep, this got you super interested in this stuff. Yep. Um, I'm guessing that you studied this more or less on your own through high school, but then you start college, and that was the stuff that you studied. As you started out, like you knew day one, I want to, I want to get enough. That's not entirely true. Really? Okay. Um, I, as a kid, before I got introduced to this medieval idea, um, I had this crazy thought of going into space. Okay. And anyone who <laughs> knows crazy. me, a few that anyone gone. who knows me knows that this is crazy for okay. me. Um, because I wanted to be an astronaut. Okay. Be- without any doubt, I wanted to fly up into space and, and see what was out there. Sure. I quickly realized throughout high school that, okay, I can do math. I'm just not good at math (laughs) and I don't like it. (laughs) And then I got into physics and I absolutely loathed sure. physics. That class was abominable to me. But I mean, you don't necessarily, what, you could have been a botanist or something. Yeah, no. Some, I, they need all kinds <laughs> up there. They need all kinds in space. You know? But I thought, okay, maybe it's the teachers that I was having. Okay. Um, I couldn't learn from them. Or they, I thought the one didn't like me. And I really think she didn't like <laughs> me. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe when I get into college, it'll be different. Sure. So I go into college thinking I'm going to be an engineering major. And I'm going to be an astronautical engineering major. Okay. And I go for orientation that first day and I see, they give us a tour of the engineering building. Okay. And I see these labs and they've got like robotics and they've got all this other cool tech and things like that. And in my mind, I am losing my mind (laughs) because I am freaking out about how crazy complicated everything looks. Really? Okay. And I felt like I was in a dungeon. (laughs) I didn't want to be there. I was like, no, nope, there's nothing here that interests me. None of this looks like space. You know what, though? This is great because you didn't pay for shit in that yes. world before. You know, this was all in the orientation yep. phase. All in orientation. Um, that day, 
I changed my major to English because I thought, well, all right, space is out. I can't do this. Um, and I'm not smart enough to do this math anyway. Right. So what else do I like to do? I like to read. Sure. I'm going to be an English major. Right. And That's a good way to start. After that, I never changed my major through the four years of college for undergrad, went directly into my master's program and it's history from there. Right. Okay. English has been my, my go-to since then. Sure. And then the history of essentially, right? I yeah. Mean, okay. Cause that yeah, ties yeah. directly into like this medieval stuff that you ended up eventually specializing in. It right? took me a while to figure it out, okay. honestly. Um, cause when you, when you think of English and you think, okay, what do you want to do? Like writing? Do you want to do literature? Do you want to do creative writing? What do you want to do? And I thought, well, I like to read. So literature is going to be my, yeah. my go-to. And they said, okay, well, what do, you, do you like American? Do you like British? Do you like world? Do you like something, you know, like, you know, Indian, Chinese, what's your, sure. what's your deal? And it's I, a niche. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like being able to read it without a translator, right? right? That's good. Sure. So, um, then I, you know, reading more and I figured, okay, I like British lit. That's, that's going to be my go-to is British lit. There are British authors. I can't stand. Really? There okay. are ones that I just don't like. So one, I can't stand, which came a lot later than mm -hmm. your time period, but, uh, I just want to get your opinion on it. Yeah. I hate reading the Scarlet letter. That was like one of the <laughs> hardest books I ever read. Okay. And if any of you listening have ever read the Scarlet letter, like the original tech, not, I guess it's probably not the original text, but as closely as it was to the original text. Mm -hmm. It's extremely high level it words and it's not even like the words. It's just the way that they're, they're, they're using words that we just wouldn't, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So is that the style that of, 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 um, literature that you would read, like stuff that's kind of like thee and thou and, and it doth and all that. I mean, how, how, like those simple, <laughs> like times, uh, it, uh, uh, words that we now use as you and me and there and the, yeah, is that that's the all kind thanks of stuff? to Shakespeare. Okay. Uh, with that thee and thou crap. Right. Well, uh, I didn't know if, is that something that, cause you know, most of my <laughs> learning would be through the media and you would see a lot of that. If I'm seeing a depiction of the medieval ages, a lot of times they're just doing a more generic washed down version, mm -hmm. but is it more complicated at that, at the stuff that you were learning? Like, was it hard to read when you were in school? Like the old English stuff? The, yeah, the I guess. Medieval stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Is it like that? Like, just like you have to really focus just to get through a page? Yes. Okay. <laughs> a okay. lot of it. A okay. lot of it. Um, and well, for the, for old English, which I came to learn much later, yeah. um, I was reading medieval stuff in translation. Okay. Um, as an undergrad and even into my first master's program, it was all translation. Sure. Um, cause the school I was at Youngstown state, go penguins. Ooh. Um, <laughs> we didn't have a dedicated medieval program. Okay. Um, not like UNM has. Sure. So I was reading everything in translation, but our, uh, instructor, our, our professor had gotten her degree in medieval studies as well. Okay. Um, and so she knew the background to this. Right. And I'm sure she probably can't stand doing the in translation stuff. Sure. Um, I know I don't because I like seeing the original right. language there, even right, if right. it's hard to get through. Um, but so it would be translated and it would be more modern. Okay. So then when you get to Shakespeare, after reading translations of all this other stuff, you're like, well, where the heck does this thee and thou crap come sure. from? Sure. Right. You know, so it's almost a style specific to his author, like to him writing. Well, it actually came down from a progression through old and middle English, okay. which you you don't learn unless you look at the linguistics of it. Okay. So in old English, the I, you, and let's say, um, he, she, it, right. Those pronouns okay. don't sound very similar to what we have. So our pronoun, I, if we're talking about the first person, it's actually each hmm. I see okay. in old English. Okay. And, um, it's, and some people will try to say, ich, right. right. But it's each, okay. uh, given the linguistics rules. And so you have each, and then you have thu as you. Okay. Right. So if you think of, all right, well, what did Shakespeare say? Thou. Right. Right. So thu, thou, there oh, sure. is kind of a progression sure. there. You're skipping the middle English part. Right. Which, cha which changes thu to, uh, well, you get the TH letters and then you get a little bit more sounding like what Shakespeare did. Okay. And then when you get to Shakespeare, you're like, okay, I see the vowel sure. there. And so then that changes it, to, it's you. almost like it's more romantic and more like presentable. It doesn't sound as like, as hard as like yeah. through, you know, like when you say thou, it's almost more poetic. You yeah. Know? So absolutely. maybe it was made for the theater. You know what I mean? Like I feel like that was his angle. I, I think a lot of people think it's romantic okay. in that way. Okay. Um, not in the literary romantic way, but in the like, 
Ooh, right. you know, fanciful, romantic way um, to say thou, right? Like, oh, Romeo, where art thou, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. But it's um, not historically accurate is what you're saying. No, it is. Okay. It is okay. historically accurate. Um, it just, it kind of makes my skin crawl a little bit because <laughs> <laughs> um, I know where, where the, the words come from. Sure. And you have this thu in the beginning and that's that's very harsh and it's German, right? right? It's very German okay. influence. Okay. And then as the progression of linguistics happens throughout English, um, then you get this, these like fancy, fanciful terms like right. thou, which then translates to you. Right. Right. So actually the modern you sounds a whole lot like thu sure. more than thou. Right. right. And that might've been more for economy, like to speed up conversation, you yeah, know, like absolutely. merchants, like talking back and forth, you know, you yeah. get enough vowels. Slang and- <laughs> was a thing. Like slang has always been a thing. Okay. And so when we get like the written down version, that's like the the fancy stuff that's sure. the formal stuff right 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 you're writing so, a letter to mom or to your family member right, it needs to look good and right or you're writing an email to your boss okay, or something yeah, like that okay. right We're formal writing sure. um but when you're talking to your friends you're not gonna write like that right. you're not gonna talk like that um so those give me some cuss those... words can you are you allowed to i know <laughs> I don't actually... jessica's a teacher by the way guys she, she's actually so i don't know if you're are you wanting to Throw a couple cuss words out there. Is there any sort of derogatory from back then? In Could you say English, fuck? I mean, was that? Yeah. Uh, it was just kind of like fuck. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it it it. is written down there. There are, um, instances of, of the word fuck in the, at least middle English period. Okay. It it was a word back then. Um, it may not have the same kind of derogatory, like extreme derogatory, uh, connotation that it has now. Or just like a lovely filler, you know, fuck fills in for all kinds of stuff. It really does. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a versatile word. It can be a noun. It can be a verb. It can be an adjective. Happy, sad, anything. Anything. Yeah. It can be anything um as far as like old english though um you didn't really get very many cuss words at least not written down sure and that's probably because of the people who were writing right um most things were written down by monks right um they're not gonna be being so religious they're not gonna write that stuff down um even in our epic beowulf um you don't really get our hero cursing. Sure. Right. If you like, if you think of like an equivalent, like say Die Hard. Okay. Right. John McClane is going to swear. <laughs> he is gonna say fuck. He is gonna say those those cheesy y- one liner. Come on. Yippee ki yay. Right. <laughs> He's gonna say all that. Yeah. Beowulf's not going to say that. Sure, sure. Um, but if you really think of like who Beowulf probably was, he was a beer swigging um, uh, dudes dude, right? Right. Who, I, I, whenever I teach it to my students, I tell them, "All right, let me preface going into Beowulf saying I hate him. <laughs> he is the worst character on the in this in this piece. Why? Because he's an asshole." He's an ass- <laughs> He is just an asshole, but he's the, I got this guy. Okay. That's what I call it. He's the, I got this guy. Because no matter what happens, I got this. Right. Grendel attacks. I got this. Yeah. Grendel's mom's attacking. Right. I got this. 50 years down the line, he's a king in his land, right? Uh, Grendel and Grendel's mom have been dead for 50 years. He's ruling his own land, his his uh, yat land, right? Yat land. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> people say he's a geet because okay. uh, it's spelled G-E-A-T. Okay. Um, but it's actually pronounced yat. Okay. So he's from Yatland. I like this. Um, I like all these corrections. You know, I want to read stuff like, you know the correct way to say that. <laughs> well, you'll hear it both ways, even okay. at a conference, but... So he's a yat. He's he's ruling the yats. He has done that for 50 years. And then all of a sudden, this little twerp goes into a dragon's lair and steals a damn cup. Right. Right? So are you are you are you seeing some Lord of the Rings here? Sure. You're seeing some Hobbit right. here? Because guess what? J.R.L. Tolkien or Tolkien was a medievalist. Okay. He was wow. an Anglo Saxonist. That's super like cool. Me. Right. <laughs> Well, so, cause he was in, uh, Oxford. Do I have that right? Was that where he was at? Right. Okay. And then that was, he was like a lifelong, basically a, a scholar yep. essentially. Right. Yeah. Okay. Kinda he like actually you. wrote one of the, the, um, the pieces that we read about Beowulf and his fight with the monsters. Okay. Um, and it is, it is the piece you go to. It was written in like the sixties. Right. And we still go to it as the reverent piece that you read when you want to talk about Beowulf and the monsters. Now it's still a story, right? Yeah. I mean, granted, we, we would know that it, I mean a lot of that could be fictional anyways but none of it comes from like like the King Arthur story like how that's supposedly based in some truth the, the Beowulf 
It's not really <laughs> no. okay. But, but I mean, it granted the names and stuff like that, but was there never actually a scenario close to that? Of course, without Merlin, I would imagine, but you know, like, well, so you're talking about two King vastly Arthur. different okay. areas. Okay. Uh, well, Beowulf okay. And, and King Arthur. And these are different spots on the time scales. Way saying. different. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Beowulf is old English. Okay. He's, um, the dating is, is debated. That's okay. one of the big debates in the old English world. So almost biblical times. Like when we're talking no, early. No. no. Okay. Um, so still within that 400 to a thousand range. Okay. Um, some people think it was eighth century, which is super early. Okay. Um, some people think it's as late as the 11th century, uh, given the King who was a uh, Viking at that point. Uh, King Canute. So we're dealing with, and the whole reason for that is because it's an English piece written mm-hmm. by English people right. about Scandinavians. Huh. Why would we have this epic piece about people who were not there? We didn't care about them. And in fact, we really didn't like them. I think I know. Because we they kept raiding us. Well, they didn't have caves, <laughs> you know, you got to have a place, you got to set the story up, you know, <laughs> they had mountains there. It fits. I don't know. Very, yeah, that could be. <laughs> Um, maybe England didn't have the kinds of monsters that they yeah, thought Scandinavian right. had. Well, and it sounds scarier when it's a foreign, yeah. you know, you know that what I mean? Too. Telling that kids too. the Beowulf story, they're like, you better not be outside after, you know, dark. <laughs> You'll get eaten. Grendel will get you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that one takes place in between sometime between the 8th and the 11th century. Or that's when it was written down. So that's Beowulf. Where did King Arthur's story originate? That's much later. Okay. Um, like 13th, 14th century. Interesting. So okay. 12, 1300s. Sure. Uh, king Arthur didn't actually exist. Okay. He, there's no king of England called Arthur. Right. Okay. Um, there are theories about who who actually did rule okay. could have been the influence sure. of writing King Arthur. Okay. Um, but there was no Sir Gowan. There was no round table. There was You're nothing telling me like there's that. no Merlin? I thought magic was real. Oh, magic is real. I, I never can't got deny my Hogwarts them. letter. I'm a muggle. <laughs> um, no, but I, okay. So, so uh, we're talking about uh, uh, basically this, this is some stuff that is, is stories that are, are influenced by history. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to, uh, okay, let's debate one more. Sure. What about Robin Hood? Was that, was that legit? No, not at all. No. Okay. So, but the 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 Sherwood Forest is no. a real thing. It's not a thing. No. no? Oh no. <laughs> I thought I had. Uh, okay. So it was based Robin around. Robin Hood made Marion. All none that. None of it. No. Okay. But there was wasn't there a town that this story was came out of? Wasn't that Nottingham? Do I have that right? Nottingham does exist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nottingham so maybe is a it was place. written from somebody in that era. That maybe that that place. Could be. Who knows? Um, okay. A lot of the places do exist. Okay. Right. Um. But as that's pretty much as far as it goes. Okay. Um. I think of them as like folk. Tales. Okay. Right. So things that we tell our kids about different places around the world, sure. right? We don't, we know that Hansel and Gretel didn't really exist, right? but it tells a good story. Sure. Teaches a lesson. Right. Teaches right. a lesson. There's a moral to it. I mean, yeah. Things and this like is what, uh, very debatable, but I mm-hmm. feel like this is what a lot of religion had to do with because at the time you, you didn't have education the way you do now. Mm-hmm. So you had to teach basic stuff when you can get all these idiots together in a, in a room <laughs> and be like, Hey, stupid, you know, don't rape, pillage, plunder, all that stuff. But so that's kind of the idea, right? Like these stories were told to probably help guide morals in a I very general it, sense. Some of them, maybe, um, a lot of them, I think it was just entertainment value really. Um, because a lot of the, the poor folks were not being told about King Arthur. Okay. Um, these were stories told to the Kings, right? Right. These were made for the upper class. Are, are these mostly, uh, um, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Gestures like, uh, audibly, like, like saying the story, singing the story yeah. rather than it being written. Right. Like it was more yeah. of that kind of stuff. I mean, okay. They were written down. Okay. Um, but a lot of it, um, like, especially in the older period, right. Beowulf was an oral story. Okay. It was, it, we, that's why we don't know how old it is actually, sure. because it was written down, but the person who wrote it down is probably not the author. So of like that the story. Odyssey, essentially how the Odyssey was, was moved along the story of Odysseus, right. Mm-hmm. That was moved along through Odyssey rather than yeah. being written for a long time. So yeah. who knows who actually came up with it? Yeah, absolutely. It's probably pieced together. Absolutely. Okay, you know, okay. Um, uh, Homer wrote down the Odyssey. Right. Right. But, um, and people are probably going to not be happy with me for right. talking about the Odyssey because sure. it's not my, my hey, area. I debated an English teacher for a minute on this, this Homer <laughs> issue because I was like, well, if he's the first one to write it down, he didn't necessarily be the first one, you know, and it was, oh, well. But I guess that version of the story so, I mean, you take Homer. down, you take the idea of the hero's journey, right? Okay. And that's what the Odyssey is. Sure. It's a really long version of right. the hero's journey. Well, same like Lord of the Rings and things like Absolutely. that. Okay. Okay. These so. tropes keep coming through. They sure. keep coming down. Um, you know, so things that came up like sirens and cyclops and things like sure. that, that's all just legend. Right. All boiled down into the hero's journey. Sure. Right. So even Beowulf, we have, he's on a hero's journey. It's not your typical one. Um, there's no like woman who helps or anything. Um, 
but we do have these same kind of folktale legendary type stories. Um, and the, the biggest issue with talking about stories in, um, or, or books or, or texts, we're going to, we'll say texts, um, from the middle ages is that you have to remember who wrote them down. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're talking about Beowulf. Like that's, that's the, the typical type of text. And that's very not true. Um, Beowulf is very much an outlier as far as what kinds of texts we have from the middle ages. So again, like, that like middle age, middle, uh, uh, income type folks like you and I, we probably would see more church stuff Absolutely. or religious stuff more than we would entertainment value stuff like Beowulf or things like that. Beowulf would probably have been one of those like special, let's go down to the town square and hear this poet sure. recite this 3,182 line long piece. Did you just know exactly how long? Of course. Wow. I mean, high five, right? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, one of my one of my chapters of my dissertation is all about Beowulf. Okay. So I have to know how long sure. it is. I have to know what you, it is. Uh, uh, just just for fun, I'm a big movie buff. What, mm-hmm. Which one do you like of the Beowulfs that have been released? The Angelina Jolie? None of them. Iterate? Really? Okay. No, no they okay. all suck. Now, do you, but, <laughs> but in the same breath, do you not appreciate the fact that movies are trying to squeeze a lot of things, 3,100 lines or whatever, yep. into an hour and a half? You know what I, I mean? do appreciate that they tried. Okay. I really okay. appreciate that they tried and i really appreciate that in the scenes where you see the big evil monster grendel and i use evil and monster very loosely because i am a huge grendel fan (laughs) i think he's a misunderstood soul wow personally um but when you see him on screen and he he's speaking what sounds like gibberish okay uh, from a medievalist perspective he's speaking old english Oh, wow. If you really listen to what he's saying and even following along in the um, Old English text, okay. if you have a book that has both, um, he's speaking his lines or he's speaking lines. So we're hearing ich. Of and, Old English. And, yeah, and you'll hear like that. that ich, oh, okay. that each sound for I. Um, right. And of, even though uh, in the text, Grendel doesn't speak, okay. he is speaking Old English. Sure. So hearing that, okay, that warms my heart a little bit. Yeah. That makes me a little more fond They're of They're aiming that. for historical accuracy in right. one, one way or another. Okay. Um, the, the part with, with Grendel's mom and Hrothgar having this affair and all that crap. No, yeah. that never it's happens. It's a little Hollywood. That never so happens. What, so what about, okay, so so tell me of, of any, um, you know, we're Americans, most Americans watching movies and TV shows more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any TV show movie that you felt like landed pretty close to the a typical depiction of an actual medieval and I know we're talking about a huge <laughs> swath of time and there's a lot of movies made that yeah. run in between those timelines, but yeah, roughly yeah, yeah. between your 400 and your 1500, right. what's a movie that you think kind of struck close <clears throat> and you were like, all right, all right. Hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I don't think there is one really. What about the 13th warrior? No, you know, I'm one of the few who's never seen that. Oh, get out of here. You know I what? know everybody tells me you need to see this. You need to see it's this. It's got I like will. one of the lowest ratings of all time, but I just, I watched <laughs> it since I was a kid and yeah. it was just so fantastical. I loved it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, I think it's actually a Beowulf story. Do I have that right? I believe it is. Yeah. yeah. It's like a remix kind of like, Oh brother, where art thou with the, the yep. Odyssey, right? Yeah. It's like kind of yeah. like this Absolutely. fun mix up, you know, which I love that movie. Right. I really love that oh, movie. Oh, I love it. But yeah. Oh, brother, um, art thou, I used to times. teach that movie actually. Teach that movie. Yeah. I used to use it as a teaching tool in my, one of my writing classes. So you were the cool teachers oh, yeah. we watched movies <laughs> I, I showed nightmare before christmas nice um, okay to inspire students writing okay. um, their prompt was to okay so jack is coming to our town what do you show him oh that's cool that kind of okay thing. uh oh brother or though i forget the prompt i used for that um but kind of kind of along the lines of the odyssey and, sure. and how does this interpret sure. that kind of stuff no you could do tons with that yeah. i mean that movie is just amazing yeah absolutely <laughs> um so i've never seen the 13th warrior um a lot of people do tell me this is a great, uh, a great medieval sure. type of movie. Um, there are ones, and I know there are people who are going to say, you forgot about this one. You forgot about that one. Um, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, actually at UNM, there's uh, a group that we have formed called the medieval studies student association. Okay. And each semester we show three movies throughout the, throughout the course of the semester that are medieval based. Okay. One of them is usually fun and okay. uh, anachronistic. So, um, not super, super accurate or anything right. like that. And then we show two more that are a bit more accurate. Okay. Um, and they try, they really try to get it as right as possible. Um, so like in the name of the rose, okay, we show that one. Uh, it has Sean Connery in it. I don't know if um, I've ever watched that. And it's, it's a really great movie. It's a little bit slow going. 
Okay. Um, and you have to know stuff about War of the Roses and things like that from the later medieval history period. Okay. Um, but it's a pretty solid um, exploration of that time and sure. a retelling of that time. Well, and I think that goes to speak to a lot of things that maybe uh, Hollywood constantly is trying to go, go over the top, where <laughs> when you see a real depiction from a medievalist, mm -hmm. then you're seeing that it wasn't quite as glitz and glam as, yep. you know, or as exciting as fast paced, right? Because I'm sure that it was yeah. just normal humans being humans and a lot of. I know there, there's one about the about um, a character, a woman called Hildegard of Bingen, okay. um, who's actually a really strong, powerful woman. Okay. Um, but the religious aspect of her, she's very, very religious, okay. um, makes her very boring to a lot of people. Okay. Even though she was strong in her convictions and things like that, and she's kind of like a Joan of Arc. I was about to say type that because that kind of threw me off about that movie. I watched it recently and I hadn't watched it since I was a kid, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised at how much the religion was just oh, yeah. that was just the entire movie, and oh, I mean yeah. to the point where she was basically sick with it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean it was like crazy, uh, but I, I can totally understand how yeah. if you get. That's one example of, you know, we've had, what, 20 billion humans come and go since before our time, yep. you know, and, and to see that there's probably a few more of them crazies out there, oh, you know, yeah. that yeah, we're yeah, going yeah. on these massive journeys because of a, a voice in their head. <laughs> well, read the book of Marjorie Kemp. Okay. Uh, it's a later medieval story and you will hate her. You will hate so her. So <laughs> much. <laughs> But only because she is the most annoying woman you will ever meet or think about meeting. Right. And all she does, she's on a pilgrimage. That's okay. the whole story. She's on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Okay. Um, and she goes on this pilgrimage all the time. Like, so it's not just her like one and done, like most pilgrims are. Yeah. She goes on it constantly. And sure. she joined in with this group of pilgrims. Sure. And they all hate her huh. because she does nothing but cry. Huh. The whole story is her crying out to God, literally crying and wailing about how she's not worthy, how she's not appropriate, how she shouldn't be on this and how she wants God to give her strength and all of this stuff. And really, she's like the most religious person you could ever think of right, right. now. Um, but because she cries and moans and wails all day, all night. You hate her. Right. You just can't stand her. And she has a maidservant that you just end up feeling so bad for. Right. Because she yells at her and she makes her feel so It's like the bad. dramatic drunk friend that you're taking care of, but 24 <laughs> seven, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Life. And like, you're trying to give them like, you know, bread to sop up sure. all the alcohol sure. or something. And stuff it in your mouth. Shut they're up. They're just like please. yelling at you. Like, I don't want the bread. You know, and you're like, oh <laughs> God, why do I like you? I'm going to leave you in the toilet. I swear to God. Yep. Like, why am I here with you? I don't like you. God, go away. Um, and actually my thesis advisor from uh, Youngstown State, who was the one who got me super interested in the medieval period, wrote um, a young adult story okay. that is part medieval, part young adult. And it's about the maidservant okay. who travels with Marjorie from Kemp. Like her perspective. And it's from her perspective. Right. Again, I see another metal song coming out of that, you know, like, <laughs> just all nice. Or like even, have you seen the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, you remember the maidservant when she grows to grab the infinity stone and like oh, explodes, yeah, yeah. like, you know, I'm tired of this shit. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> I'm gonna and pull myself up. you just love the way that the maidservant is depicted and she's like, you feel bad for her still. Um, and you just want to be like, Oh, just slap Marjorie. Yeah. Just please slap her. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, you guys are, you guys are going through this teaching stuff. What was your like, um, Cause it, cause it, I feel like this is, we're kind of skipping just a little bit of it, but what's like a capstone project? Like you're writing a thesis and you said that this thesis is essentially what's going to earn you your PhD once yep. it's, it would be peer reviewed, right? Isn't that the idea? Uh, once my committee reviews it. Okay. Um, so the whole process is basically you come up with an idea and you identify who your advisor is going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the person who's going to direct your project okay. and help you through, look at your drafts before it goes to your committee. True. Um, and help you um, identify texts that you should look through, um, other scholars whose work you should definitely include right. if you haven't come across it yet, um, things like that. So I came up with my concept and I knew right away who my director was going to be. Sure. Um, and so he's a great director, John. Um, and he was like super excited about my idea and thought, you well, know, what is your idea? I so, guess. um, because I mentioned about being the goth girl, right, of my high school, that never really truly left me. Okay. Um, I love everything macabre. I love everything dark and scary right. and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to write something that had to do with the the macabre dark side of the Middle Ages, right. if you know that can even be identified. Right? Sure, sure. Um, so I wanted to write about dead people. <laughs> And so I came up with, and I can't just say, well, John, I want to write about dead people. Right. And be like, yeah, I know, but what else? 
know, and what about them? <laughs> yeah, it, he we, he's been uh, at UNM I think for four or five years now, and so we've gotten to know each other pretty well. And so me coming up to him saying, "Yeah, I want to write about dead people." Yeah, what else? Yeah, what else is new? Um, <laughs> so I came up with a much more um, uh, focused, scholastic sounding sure. concept, which was to examine old English literature. And my original concept was to do all of it, like anything I could come up with, okay. any medieval piece I could come up with that was in old English and, um, identify where the corpses came in, uh, which authors talked about them, which authors didn't, um, why okay. that happened either way, um, who got a brief mention and whose corpse was given pages upon pages huh. of text and kind of using it, um, just using these texts and examining them. And then I had to bring in, or I decided to bring in archeological and anthropological evidence and studies. You're talking bodies. She brought bodies in. No, I didn't bring bodies. Okay. In. Well, it's I on wanted corpses. to go to the bodies. <laughs> I wanted to go to the bodies. <laughs> and actually on a summer road trip, I did get to see two skeletons okay. in a church that were the relics of two saints. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you. So, so that's like some field work that you're doing and <laughs> before, right before you'd get into building this thesis. It wasn't actually legit field work, okay. but I just said, like, I found out that this church had, in, I think it was in Tennessee or Kentucky They got or corpses. Something. They, they had got corpses. bodies <laughs> and they're on display. I was like, yeah, I'm going. Like, there's no way I'm not going. <laughs> right. To see these two bodies. Um, so I got to see these these two skeletons who are still in this, like, these regal uh, garb and all right. these kinds of stuff. And it was so essentially just, era, medieval era stuff and, and locked I, into that, like... I don't know that they were medieval era. Per se, okay. um, maybe a little bit later. Okay. Um, but definitely saints. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or they were made to be saints. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Right. Um, so I came up with this idea that I wanted to incorporate archaeological evidence right. um, from previous digs that they had done and other scholars who had written about it and um, anthropological information based on what they found right. in those digs. So things about the culture um, as well as the, the actual bodies and graves themselves. So could we be correct in saying that the thesis is essentially about the medieval times' perspective uh, or scope of like death, like how that, how they treated it and how it was related to to society. And then also like in like that's how they an would bury them and stuff like that. Uh, that's a, that's an aspect of it. Okay. Um, but I can't say that I talk all about just death. Okay. Um, because I wanted to write about the societal impact on the literature. Okay. That's where it basically comes down to sure. what it boils down to is how did the society think about their corpses from the lowly low class, um, peasant right. all the way up to a king or so, a saint. So essentially like how valuable were people mm -hmm. dependent on the, like a class system, like the, like the case system in India, right? Where they, if that was the, the point, okay. yeah. If that was how they decided who got the attention or right. not, like you'd be in a mass grave if you're poor, whereas you could probably have better graves, the more income right. you had and stuff like that. Right, right, right. Um, and so I had to go through the literature and see Okay, this author focused on um, Beowulf, of course. So let's say the Beowulf poet. Okay. Um, so he focused on, at the very end, spoiler alert, Beowulf dies. Oh, no. Um, he gets killed by a dragon <laughs> because he's 70 right. fighting a dragon. How dare you? Because he's, he's the, I got this guy. He's the he, everyman, though. And he Come wouldn't on. listen. No, he's definitely not the everyman. <laughs> he wouldn't listen to his advisor who was like, hey, you have a bunch of young 20-year-old men who are willing to die for you right. and fight this dragon. Yeah. Why don't you stay here where the people need you to rule and have somebody else fight? Right, fight for you. Yeah, yeah he wouldn't do that. Anyway, so the dragon kills him, okay. but he also kills the dragon. Okay. So simultaneous. Um, so his corpse, of course, is going to get lots of attention right. at the very end. Sure. So he gets burned, but he also then gets put into a burial mound. And so there's wailing women, which is a typical trope, um, and all this other stuff. And you could see his mound from miles and miles away. Sure, sure. All pyramid kind of thing, kind of like yeah, Egypt. You got Yeah. yeah. He's, he's got the biggest pyramid. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I want the biggest. I want all the, the glory. biggest hill. Yeah. Got you. But then there's also another scene, uh, which I really like, that is a battle scene. And at the very end of this battle scene, um, the author says that there were bodies littering the battlefield and that they were attempting to have been plundered by their enemies. Okay. So that happened a lot. If sure. you, if you won, you got to go and 
pillage. I get some new shoes, get a pocket watch, whatever. Yeah, going or on. money, or right. I or, guess I didn't have pocket watches. No, not times. so much. Um, but you <laughs> a know, sundial on the wrist, whatever. Some kind of some kind of saver <laughs> sword, sure. whatever yeah, I got it was. You. Um, so the author tells this, but it's in a two line thing, and that's it. And then he moves on. Huh. So there were bodies everywhere. People were trying to pillage them. Move on. I love how this this caught you perfectly. You're like, there's it, only two lines. What the hell? It Give really did. <laughs> All these people died. And like the the scene is just like blood soaking into the the dirt and the grass. And you can tell that like, you know, they're, they're just mangled bodies everywhere. And it's just a death scene. It's the typical. So did we talk about you writing metal songs at all? I know I've said it. <laughs> I really I guess should. Perfect. It's, no, it's, I hear like a like a Black Dahlia murder kind of song. Yeah, absolutely. Out of that, you know? <laughs> um, so, but the author only gives two lines to all of these corpses. Sure. So my idea kind of stemmed from that that concept is well, okay, obviously Beowulf's the hero; he's going to get more attention. But these people did something really grand right. on a grand scale, representing some, a bigger idea, right? Than themselves. And sure. you know, in modern times, if we think about a battle scene. Right. And all of those soldiers who die, we have the utmost reverence for them. Right. And, you know, the Marines never leave a, a man behind. Sure. Everybody gets brought home. Right. These guys don't get brought home. Right. They get pillaged by their enemies and then they're left for to the beasts rot. of battle. Oh, my God. The beasts of battle are going to come in, pick their eyes out, right. take out all their, you know, intestines and organs. And like, so a wolf is just going to tear open somebody's guts. Right. The, the ravens are going to come and pick the eyes out and get it. all this other stuff. And I'm, you know, again, if you're, you're, listening and you're eating i'm sorry <laughs> i but, get so excited talking about this stuff <laughs> but, but so essentially your, your work is to try to like focus on the things that weren't focused on so much at face value out yeah. of like medieval text yeah. essentially okay yeah. like those 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 dying scenes and then wh where where are you planning on taking this once you do because you, you've written this thesis mm -hmm. okay yeah so, so it's do done it's complete okay the, cool. the dissertation is complete um there's still some revision to be done because now, um, now that my director has approved all of the chapters and he's given me revisions back, um, now I got to send it out to the rest of the committee, which is a horrifying thought because <laughs> now I have three more people who are all experts in this field, sure. uh, in their respective fields. And one of them is actually British. And so when you give a British guy stuff about British history right. and literature, you're, you're um, hoping you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. You really hope you nailed it. Plus he's the smartest person I think I I've ever met wow. uh, Dr. Tim Graham. In English accent in the whole bit? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's an amazing... You just can't not like, be tuned in like, mm-hmm, He's an amazing more. scholar. <laughs> he's an amazing teacher. Just everything about him is just fantastic. Sure. And you just want to absorb every single thing he knows because he can come into a three-hour seminar with no notes and talk as if he was reading a script. Sure. And it is amazing. Well, and he's that passionate about what he does, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, he's been doing it for... Well, look at you. You've been, you've been off the top of the dome. I'm over here with my notes, you know. <laughs> so, let, so let's uh, uh, let's try to take... Uh, and, and, and as vividly as you would like to, I know that, that we, <laughs> we, we've kind of dug into like the, uh, the death stuff, but yeah. um, I wake up, I drive to work in the morning, I work, I come home, yep. eat, watch some TV whatever, work out, something like that, go to yeah. bed. If I'm <clears throat> 31, 30, I'll be 31 into this month. So if anyone wants to send me a birthday card, no, uh, uh, <laughs> Happy early birthday. Right, thank you. Um, if, so I'm 31, uh, uh, you know, what is my life like if I'm in, you know, 15, pick an era for me, pick an, a, a, a year frame, okay. you know, hundred years or whatever. Yep. What's a typical male doing middle-class kind of guy? So because I'm an Anglo-Saxonist, we'll go from the early perspective. Okay. Um, Typical guy, uh, middle class in that time frame, depending on the month of the year, I would say. Sure. Um, and depending on your skill set, I would say uh, you're getting up at the crack of dawn. Okay. You are letting your wife or, or whoever um, take care of pretty much everything. In the household. In the house. Right. Uh, because that would have been her job. Right. Because um, she would not have gone to work. Um, or if she did, her work was at home. Right. So she would have been maybe a seamstress or a jewelry maker or something like that. Okay. Um, making rugs, things like that. Sure. Um, for you, you'd be letting her take care of the kids, her take care of the goats, her take care of all that other stuff, um, make you breakfast, whatever it might be. Sure. And then if you are a farmer, you're going to go work your land. Right. All day. All day. Okay. Pretty much. Uh, if you're a <clears> merchant, <throat> You're going to go to wherever you're going to sell your wares. Uh, if you're in a big city, then maybe you are um, going to an artisan shop. Um, you have a 
maybe you work for an artisan. Um, so you're an apprentice okay. or, um, blacksmith, something like that. Blacksmith, something like that. Okay. Yep. And there was no, and I'm guessing there's nothing protecting me if I have any sort of anything with my job, right? Like don't get hurt. No, you might die. Is, <laughs> no, is there's like no the insurance. Goes, right? okay. <laughs> there's no workers. Comp. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I mean, and, and was it, what would be considered a good job for me? Again, not, I'm not Royal. I don't have anything for me. That's going right. to help me in terms of like my social status. Right. So if I got a, if I got a job at the castle, am I, am I pretty gangster compared to my, to my peers <laughs> or is yeah. like, okay. And, yeah. and, and, and would it the be king true? The would probably pay you really well. Okay. Um, depending on what you did. Of okay. Course. Yeah. And, and, and so in a surf situation, surfs for anybody that doesn't know is essentially an indentured person that mm-hmm. would work for a, a kingdom or, or some sort of landowner. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. you were kind of living on the property. You're getting a small wage, something like that. Was there a lot more of that? And was that a safer bet than trying to be out like outside of a city and like doing your own thing? Like what the, was a better the bet? surf system was not super big in the early middle ages. Okay. That was more of a later middle ages okay. thing. Um, so hopefully you would be able to have your own land. Okay. Um, if not, maybe you did have that kind of, um, job where you were, um, a day worker okay. or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or maybe you were in with some farmer. And so that would be your go-to is R- to go to his land and work it for him. Um, but otherwise you'd want to try and get within a, get in with a merchant. Um, cause merchant would have been a little bit higher up more sure. money sure. if he has his own place. Right. Um, so maybe you'd be his apprentice. Maybe you'd just work at his shop. I see. Okay. Things like that. If you work for the king, um, then you were, yeah, either going to be like the equivalent of like a butler. Okay. Um, you probably weren't going to see him very much sure. at all. You're doing some service job. Yeah. Basically. You're okay. cleaning the toilets. Right. Right. That kind of thing. Right. The equivalent of that. Yeah. Right. Um, or you could be an executioner. Okay. Which I'm going to go back to my dead stuff. Okay. That's what I like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, w- I have been, I, I had been researching executioners a little bit. Okay. Um, and this isn't, I like this turn you just took here. Keep yeah, going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so executioners of the middle ages, right? Sure. Um, because of course, you know, if you were caught doing a crime, yep. uh, we didn't, they didn't quite have the same justice system that they, that was one of my questions do now okay. in yeah. England. Um, nor do they have something that's equivalent to us. Sure. Um, did they have police? Was that a thing? Like, or is it just like the rat system? Like I, I saw him do it. I don't know that they had police. They did have like a security type situation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the sheriff um, of Nottingham's not like a legit. They would have had a sheriff. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you think of the the term that it comes from, reef uh, would actually refer to like a cop okay. or some kind of equivalent reef. to that. Yeah. Reef. Okay. Um, That's a good way then, to like code it now. You know, hey, reef are coming. <laughs> the whole term sheriff actually comes from the idea of a shire reef. So the, the oh, cop of a shire. Wow. So okay. the idea of a shire is not Lord of the Rings okay. specific. Okay. Shires did exist. That's cool. Right. Um, and some of the cities in England now have that shire at okay. the end. So we just call it sure, right? Sure. Instead of shire. Okay. Um, no hobbits though. No hobbits. Okay. Not, not usually. Damn not it. usually. I always want to meet one. <laughs> I know some short people, but I don't know if yeah, they're the same. Maybe some some shorter people. So people. so our our Shire Reef, our sheriff, yep. is not necessarily the executioner. I could be an no. executioner, and that could be my daily grind. Like, damn, I got yep. three bodies to hack off today. Yeah. How, what's the what's the mode of of death typically? What's, what's... um usually it's going to be your head getting chopped off. Nice. Yeah. Okay. It's gonna it's gonna be beheading. And this um, is before the guillotine, so it's yes. not this smooth operation. Could... <laughs> the guillotine's not smooth at all. No. Actually, oh wow. That's a misnomer okay. about the. Uh, guillotine uh, many times the guillotine would not fall fast enough oh, the yeah. blade or the blade wasn't sharp enough so and you, oh. so it would take multiple chops oh to get the head God. into the basket which is what everybody waits to see is the yeah. head in the basket yeah um but it would take like a start while. booing because he's like screaming shut up why is his head still attached do it again <laughs> well funny enough actually um if you were an executioner mm-hmm. and this isn't true for all places but some places you had it was a three strike rule if you were the executioner and you had to behead your prisoner, you had three strikes to get it right. Okay. If you didn't, and that person was still wasn't dead, your head was getting chopped off. Wow. And somebody else was going to be up there Damn. doing it for you. That's uh, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to work hard on those three swings. <laughs> yeah. But the problem was that a lot of executioners were also drunks. Okay. Um, because I would imagine you nobody be really sober. wanted to yeah. be the executioner. Yeah, yeah. It paid well, sure, uh, reasonably well. But of course, if you had a lull in crime, right. or uh, people just got sentenced to prison, sure. you know, for tax 
axe or something like that. You didn't get killed for that. Right. Um, usually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is akin to like the SS guards at, uh, at the concentration camps in World War II. A lot of them that would be anywhere actively killing Jews you, or, you know, all uh, the other groups that they would also put into these camps, mm -hmm. they were uh, reportedly like super bad drunks because as much as they may have this like really weird cultist belief in their you know, Nazism or whatever, they yep. still are, you know, humans and yeah. taking people's lives is and hard for anybody. Most of them were not serial killer level, Ted Bundy, sure. that kind of thing. Sure. So yeah, it affected them. Um, so executioners, even though it was a good gig, uh, cause it paid well, right. um, not many people wanted the gig to be an executioner. Right. They didn't right. want to. So it, really they had a day job. Yeah. Um, most of these guys had a day job right? and they would wear the, um, the typical head mask. Right. Okay. Um, so that wasn't made up. They sure. would actually wear some kind of mask to cover themselves. To cover themselves. Sure. So that, you know, if it was a bigger city or a bigger town, um, you may not know who the executioner was. Okay. Uh, small town, you probably knew who it was. Right. So a lot of them didn't right, really. Bob, take the, take the sack off your head. We know it's you, and it's bro. like, we know it's you, Bob. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. We, we've seen the blood on your clothes. Like, you know, when Sally hangs out your clothes on, right. <laughs> on the line, blood's kind of hard to get out. So we know it's you. I cut myself shaving constantly. I don't know why. And somehow know. it ends up on my pant leg. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so the, the typical mode would have been beheading because it is the easiest um, at that point at that time they didn't have guns so you wouldn't have a firing squad right. they Hang did do hanging, hanging. Okay, okay they would do hanging um but hanging required you to have a a bit of an understanding of how physics works right um and how long the rope needed to be sure because if it was too short then it wouldn't completely um sever what needed to be severed sure. in order for you to actually die instantly. Right. Cause the idea of the gallows is you're on a lifted platform yep. and you need distance to try to break the neck. Right. You right. need distance up, but you also need distance down sure. okay. um, for the, for the uh, rope. Okay. And so if it's not exactly right for the individual, they had to change the rope for the individual Really? because nobody's the same height always. Sure. So if you had somebody who's like six foot one, yesterday yeah and then you have a woman who's like five foot four the same rope's not going to work so so you wouldn't just make it the gallows like super tall just to accommodate anybody's fall well they would be tall okay but um sometimes the rope length still mattered, still mattered. Uh, okay. you couldn't have it be too short that sure. you that was a lot of the problems they could figure out okay it needs to be short enough so that they don't land right on their feet i see what you're saying now okay um, but it has to be long enough to be able to crack the neck enough right so that they're not kind of just dangling there and strangling and actually themselves. strangling right because yeah, they, they wanted to make it as humane kind of was the yeah air quotes, right? even yeah, though they yeah. wanted to kill him they still didn't want to do it for a length of time plus okay. people got bored sure people wanted an instant show right um instant gratification even in the middle ages it was there right um so it's like now somebody's when you see like turning videos. purple and like eh, you yeah. know strangling themselves and all of this it's not as... Oh, I'm getting a crap in my leg. <laughs> I just came out of left field. Sorry. Oh, let me pause this real quick. Okay. Go. My bad. Had to had to take a, a, a break there, folks. I got a cramp in my leg because <laughs> apparently I don't know how to sit correctly. And then, of course, my dog went crazy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. I'm too tall, I think, is it what it works. was. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a complex. He's he cute, does. though. He's what is short. he? He's a mini dots? Uh, he's a Dachshund Manchester Terrier mix. Dachshund Manchester Terrier mix. I like this Manchester. It's an English thing. I see how you work that in there. All right. <laughs> well, and his name's Arthur. Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. But I didn't name him for King Arthur, right. actually. I named him for um, Arthur Dent from okay. the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right. Yes. Okay. I love, love it. that book. Right. Love yeah. that book. I like the book. I like the movie, too. I yeah. The well movie's done. super fun. Yeah. The movie's it, super fun. It was well done. They kept it lighthearted because there's no way to pack that whole book into that movie. Oh, so. no. There's so much that's left out, but it's so complicated. Right. Um, so we were talking about instant gratification. We were talking about people basically being killed in public yep. and we were talking about, you know, hanging and things like that. Yep. Um, stemming from me having a conversation about what's a matter or, or my question, should I say of a modern, uh, day middle, uh, class type person. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so, so you could have been a, you could have been an executioner, right? Could have been an executioner. Um, I walk out of my house and, and, uh, uh do I want to take a shower? I don't have a shower. You don't have a shower. I don't have a shower. No. I do, do what, wh you how? might get to take a bath like once a month. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now I think I read or if you're near that, a river or something okay. like that. You could, you know, do like a daily, do a daily rinse off. Sure. No soap. 
Okay, and there was there was no concept of killing any kind of like bacteria, right? It was no, probably like plant no, no, no. extracts and stuff, like lavender to smell good, rather than yeah. actually soap yourself. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. You, okay. you'd get like, okay, these flowers smell good. Right. I'm gonna maybe make an extract. Okay. Um, if there was a, a medicine woman or a medicine man or an herbalist or something like that, yeah. that was a thing. Right. Um, usually in the woods, um, these were the folks who unfortunately got called witches later sure, on. Later on, yeah. Um, but they might be able to make you some kind of tincture. Okay. Or, a, or a potion, right? right? Not like the witchy potion, right, but right, like right. A, a type of potion um, that you could rub on. Right. Or if you had some kind of uh, rash or okay. something like that, you could go to her sure. and say, what is this? And she says, oh, you went into poison ivy. Here, right. take this. The, yeah, yeah, the equivalent yeah. of like calmine lotion. Sure, right? okay. Um, so, but otherwise, no, it was, it was, you're probably going to be pretty stinky. Sure, but people, I would imagine aesthetically speaking, they would probably wash their hands, their face. Like that's probably like a normal yeah. routine, you uh, know. If you were, you know, if you had that water source, like if you were by a river or something like that, um, obviously you had to give some kind of water to your horses and right. your your goats and right. things like that. And there's no indoor plumbing, so when no. you're using the bathroom, you're using what, like a chamber pot? What's the yeah. okay? Yeah, that it, was like well, upper class would have a chamber really? pot, that kind of thing. So what do I gotta do if I gotta pee in the middle of the night? Go outside. Okay. <laughs> All right. What if I gotta do the other? Go outside. Okay. Right. <laughs> what do you do when you camp? Sure, you go outside. You dig a okay. hole, yeah. right? Dig well, a hole, that's what you do. So, okay, so so that's, so people didn't probably really have the same uh, faux pas. Like if some dude comes to work smelling like B.O., you're like, damn. You remember Everybody you smells like B.O. Everybody? So it, <laughs> okay. it didn't matter. Okay. You know, it really didn't. If you've never seen like uh, The Knight's Tale, the yeah. movie yeah. with Heath Ledger, everybody would have been so stinky. Right. It would have been terrible. Oh so like God. when their when their main knight dies in the very beginning yeah. and they talk about, oh my gosh, he smells so bad. Wait, that was everybody. Not like you really would have noticed. Right. Like, um, I'm sure like gatherings at church were probably pretty interesting. All those like, commoners. Yeah, that would have been probably pretty, pretty stinky. Yeah. So were there, were there public bathrooms? I get it. I'm, I'm going to my king job. I'm going to my executioner job. Was there a lot of like, uh, you know, now people are, it's, you know, uh, what's a good example of this? You know, uh, Somebody would not want to walk around and just squat and take a shit, you know, right. on the corner. But there were public bathrooms and, and scenarios like that. So was public right? I mean, would I be correct in saying that? I think some places had public baths, but um, that's that's a lot of utility that may not have been there, like infrastructure, right? Okay. Yeah, and especially in the early Middle Ages, that wouldn't have been a thing. Okay, um, in England, it would have been maybe in the later later part when okay. they came into it, and like when the Normans came in, yeah. and they would be like, "What is wrong with you people? <laughs> you are so stupid. Stinky, right and like you have nothing here yeah. like what did the romans do they didn't no, leave you with anything no running water apparently you guys were on the b list they didn't you like know, you like you have an irrigation system why don't you use it right you know and it's like well, we don't know how <laughs> well that, that's an interesting thing so they 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 learned uh, uh farming techniques i'm sure that had gotten pretty advanced and mm -hmm. and th this kind of stuff came from um a lot of it from the romans would i be right in saying that because weren't they big on the irrigation like taking water to places it was aqueducts things okay. like that yeah, okay. that would have all been from the Romans. Basic farming procedure, the native Britons would have known. They would have known um, how to do that. They would have perfected their land. Really perfected that. Sure. Okay. Because they have to. Right. When you have to do something via utility or for utility purposes just to be able to survive, right. you're going to get pretty good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but otherwise, like special, you know, irrigation systems, things like that. No, they wouldn't. Right. Have well, it's a massive any. project. I mean, you'd have to have, mm -hmm. I mean, thousands of people and then the money, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just uh, going down the line because uh, we're I'm I know we're going to find a way to circle back to death, but let's. Uh, it always happens. <laughs> it always happens with me. Um, a woman in, in the same scenario. You're saying mostly a homemaker, but were yep. there anybody that was, uh, for one, trying to become uh, a scholar like you? Was that a thing at no. all? No. Even even if I if you were a princess, that wouldn't. <sighs> Well, there are documented cases, um, especially things like uh, people like saints. Okay. Um, a lot of those folks, uh, female saints too, sure. started out that they were very wealthy. Right. So if you were a wealthy person, your life was drastically different than even a middle class okay. person. Um, we have maybe in modern times, if we're a middle class person, we have some of the same elements that like a super wealthy person would have. Right. Um, but in, in the middle ages, it would have been Day drastically different. Sure. So, um, so for instance, um, some of the female saints that I've uh, written about in my dissertation, they came from very wealthy families. And um, there's one called Saint Athelthrith, which Athelthrith. is an Say it amazing again. name. Athelthrith. Thrift. Oh, yeah. You you put a lot in there. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. 
So she came from a very wealthy background and her parents uh, had her learn worldly stuff, okay. uh, worldly knowledge. So she learned Greek, she learned Latin, she learned philosophy, things like that. So she's one in probably like 10,000, 20,000, Oh, easy. Right? yeah, okay. maybe more. Okay. Um, and she realized that all of that meant nothing Okay. when she learned about the Bible. Huh. So she had been given all of this secular stuff. Right. And then uh, just out of the blue one day, she picked up or found or, or came in contact with a religious person who gave her a Bible or gave her information about uh, sure. biblical stuff because books were not prevalent. And the religion of the day was Catholicism. Uh, not necessarily Catholicism. It was okay. Christianity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so... It, Deciding between the factions of Christianity would sure. be pretty tough right. at this point, um, but, but definitely something Christianity. In that, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so following the same same concepts. Um, so she she was given information about Christianity, and it changed her life. And she said, "Screw all this other stuff." in the nicest way possible, right? Um, in the most religious way possible <laughs> is that I don't want worldly stuff anymore. Um, and she was a princess or, okay. or a really wealthy, that kind of person. Sure. So she was given nice clothes and jewelry and she adorned. One of the things that she says was just, she adorned her neck with gold and that was a big thing. Right. Um, and it later played into her concept that God was punishing her earlier um, misdeeds. Ah, because she wasn't humble, kind of like a Jesus figure where you don't have wealth. Right. Right, okay. Um, and by decorating her body, people couldn't see the goodness inside, and she right. didn't focus on the goodness it, of her soul. Because they would idolize her wealth, essentially, right. rather than And her... she idolized her okay. wealth okay. a okay. bit and her worldly knowledge. Sure. And so later on, she develops this giant goiter on her neck. Goiter? Yeah, like so this like a... big tumor type thing wow. on her neck. And she That's said, hot. this was, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Super hot. Um, and so she said that this was a punishment from God okay. for adorning her neck with gold. Okay. So because of that, he now adorned her neck with this goiter, which eventually killed her. Um, even though they did have a physician, the physician did come in, lanced the goiter, right. got all the gross stuff out, um, but it still didn't work and she still died. Okay. Um, the big miracle thing about her and why I actually wrote about her, and this is going to circle back to death, um, <laughs> is because she was buried in amongst, uh, she became an, an abbess of okay. Ely, of a, a monastery, abbess. Ely. So, so this like is the like leader a, okay, of a okay. female monastery. Okay, like a lord of a female monastery. Yeah, so, the leader of it. Okay, yeah. sure. All right. um, abbess. That's an a new abbess. One. Okay. Uh, you might have heard of abbot. Right. Female version is an abbess. Or what is an abbey? What's an abbey? That's, that's the building. That's the building. That's okay, the building. sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she was buried, uh, as per her request, in a very simple wooden box among other nuns in her monastery wow. who had died. Sure. Um, simple grave, nothing fancy. And so her sister, Sexburg, decide, Sexburg. Yeah, Sexburg. Nice. Decided, um, I think it was 16 years later or 12 years later, this isn't good enough for my sister. Let's exhume her. No. So they dug up her body. Wow. And they said, and she said to these um, other monks, it was a double monastery. So there were monks and nuns. Okay. Um, the it's a co-ed monastery. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very much separate. <laughs> Very okay. much separate. Right. But together in the same building. Sure. Um, so she told some monks, hey, go find um, an appropriate coffin for her or an appropriate casket. Okay. And for them, appropriate meant marble. Okay. And so they found, miraculously, this white marble casket that is already in the shape of a casket that was perfectly suited to her size. Wow. So it fit her body length and it was perfectly for her, her size. For her bones. Yes. I mean, 16 years. Presumably, right. there would be not much left. Sure. Right? The sure. degrading wooden box. She's going to be getting eaten sure. by worms, that kind of thing. So they understood, actually, the, pos the process of decomposition. Okay. They understood maybe not what exactly was happening, but they knew that after... 16 years, there's going to be not much not flesh much left, yeah. left, right? It's, like it's going to be bones in these ratty clothes ugh. after getting, you know, all that Smells stuff happening. fabulous. Oh, mm. yeah. This, well, <laughs> after that point, it might not be too Maybe. bad. I don't know. Um, so the miraculous part, they dig her up, they open the tomb, or they open this, this wooden box, mm -hmm. which is still there, and she's perfect. Absolutely pristine. Wow. And in fact, looks cleaner than when they buried her. That's weird. No dirt, no smudges. Still goiter. No, that was another part. 
In fact, her entire body had been cleansed. Huh. So the goiter and its scar were gone. Sure. So, so would we, will we be saying that this, the, like the story is that God like forgave her or oh, whatever? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely. very, that's very cool. <laughs> um, and so they dug her up, they found her body, what we call incorrupt. Okay. So it, the earth had not taken her. It's a scientific term. Kind of. Okay. She's like, it's a medieval term. Go with it. Come on. It's our term. Um, And so she had been found incorrupt. Everybody was like losing their shit. Because they're just like, oh my God, what happened? Did we bury a living person? Like what happened? I thought she was dead. Um, And she was dead. Like she's still dead. She just looks like she's sleeping. And in fact, two of the authors who wrote stories of her said... It looks as if she's sleeping. Like a sleeping beauty type thing. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. Okay. Um, just, you know, not breathing, that kind of thing. And so they took her out of this box and they placed her in the lovely casket that they had found and they put her in the church. Huh. And this isn't what Athelthrith wanted. She didn't want to be buried in the church. Right. She wanted a humble end. Right. She had such this crazy good beginning. She wanted a humble end. Right. Um, but so the part that interested me the most was this incorruptness. Okay. Um, and what about her life influenced the fact that she was able to be incorrupt at the end because that doesn't happen with all the saints lives okay um some saints you get okay here's their it follows a typical storyline um they convert they go on a mission they convert other people somebody finds out hates it wants them dead okay or wants them to convert back to paganism right and it's always very much pagan versus Christian. Right. That was like the competing religion at the yeah, time. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so usually it's a, a Roman prefect or some kind of governor or something like that who doesn't like the new Christian ways. Right. That Stamp kind of that thing. shit out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so they arrest them. They put them in jail. They torture them in some way. Um, a lot of the times the tortures don't work. Okay. Uh, so they try to light them on fire right. and the, the uh, sticks won't catch. Or um, they ah, try I to. See, I see. They try to put them in a boiling uh, so there, water bath. So there's some divine power causing these things to to happen yeah. around these people that eventually become saints. They're not saints that they because you only become a saint after death, right? Isn't that right. the idea? Okay. Yeah. So 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 there's stories that that lead to their sainthood. Yep. Uh, is it called being canonized? Is that what they call it? Now it is. Now it is. Yeah. Okay. okay. Back then it wouldn't have been. Um, and. In, there was no like super official process sure. back then. It went after, I think it was the second Lateran council or something like that in the 1700s. I don't know. It's past my time. So I'm not sure. It's ba- <laughs> <laughs> it's- Victorian stuff. It's for the birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Restoration. Who cares? Um, during that time period, they came up with this whole canonization. What, sure. what categories does it have to fall into? Wow. But okay. they all base it on these Vita or saints life stories. Okay. Um, these life stories. Of previous saints, wow. right? So, the, and this whole um, this whole genre of saints' life stories is called hagiography. Okay, um, and it's basically just two terms: hagio from the Greek meaning saint, and graphy meaning the study of. So, the study of saints. Huh. So those are our saints' lives, what they come into. That's very interesting. Um, so they're tortured, and then eventually something will kill them. Right. So all this other stuff doesn't hurt them, doesn't kill them. And then finally it's like God's like, all right, well, you've been through enough, so I'm going to kill you now. Right. And so a, a lance through the side works sure. or d- whatever. There's one story where this woman uh, is defended by a lioness. Like she's um, she gets badass. taken to this brothel okay. because she's a virgin. Right. And they want to break her uh, out of her Christianity back sure. to paganism. And to do that, they're threatening her with taking her virginity away. Rape, basically. Yeah. Rape. Oh my God. Absolutely. Um, and there's no, like no uh, hesitation from right. the men who are going to do it. Sure. They're just like, yep, we'll do it. Nope. I yeah. don't care. Yeah. Um, and so sh- they're about to attack her. And this lioness comes out of nowhere like absolutely out of nowhere. We're not in the Savannah. We're not right, like right. in India. We're in nothing downtown like this. London or something here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not London actually. Cause a lot of these saints lives don't take place in England. Okay. Okay. Uh, but say like Rome. Okay. And this lioness just comes out of nowhere and is like, uh, uh-uh, you're not going to fuck with this woman. <laughs> Literally. You are not going to hurt her. <laughs> That's some biblical level shit though. For yeah. sure. Yeah. If okay. you want to get to her, you got to go through me. Right asshole right right and it's just this look like it's just a look right right it's not like the lion talks about a lion what the hell right and these guys are just like 
um, no, <laughs> never mind. And they leave. Yeah. Um, the lioness actually pounces on one of them oh, wow. and like gets him down on the ground and is about to basically rip his throat out. And Daria, mm-hmm. the woman, she goes, no, if he converts, don't hurt him. Oh, what a reverse. Yeah. I like this. Okay. So she talks. Do to you feel guy. like any of these stories have been manipulated though, by the people that have eventually told them to where they are now? I don't know if they've been manipulated. I think they're just tall tales. Okay. Um, okay. It, in the same way that what we deal with legends sure. and things like that. The moral guidance kind of side of the house. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but from a Christian perspective in that case. from a, Yeah. Um, actually, one of the things I was told in high school, uh, mm-hmm. so I went to a Catholic high school. Okay. Um, I am not. So you picked a side is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. Um, so I don't identify with right. religion. No, no. Either but I. I went to a Catholic high school and so we had religion classes. And one of the things that I was told that I would never, ever forget um, was asking about the truth of these biblical stories. Okay. And I was always the inquisitive person. Sure. And I said, this couldn't possibly have happened. Like, how can you build an ark this big right. with like four people? Or a lion burst into a brothel to defend right. a virgin. Right. I mean, it's kind of a, you know. Which I didn't tall. know at that point. Right, but, right, right. Gotcha. you know, going along with Noah's ark and the, sure. you know, Abraham and Come Isaac on. and all it these. It could happen. Yeah, right? <laughs> and my teacher at that point said, you can't worry about historical accuracy because these stories are not historically accurate. They are religiously true. Sure. And that will never leave my mind. Which is essentially the idea of, of, of what the entire basis of religion is, is, is belief. It's you just, lore. Right. You're belie- if you either believe in the story or you don't. Right. Or you believe in the religion. You believe that it's real. And, and for that, you react the way that they're trying to morally guide you. Right. From you have to story. have faith. Right. If you're in that line of thinking, you have faith that these stories are true enough. Right. That it tells you what you need to do or how you need to act sure. in your life. It's basically just lore, right? So I watch Supernatural. Like okay. that's right. of course I do. Um <laughs> And so all these stories that they tell about, you know, Wendigos and Arugarus and vampires and werewolves and all this other stuff. Well, that doesn't, that can't possibly be true. It can't possibly exist. But there's lore, there's books, there's ancient stories about this stuff that has a history. Right. Like the, there's a boulder in uh, Iceland, I believe, that was in the, in a road and, and they were building a road and, the Icelandic people would not allow the boulder to be moved because the little people lived in the boulder. Huh. And the little people is one of those stories that dates back and back and back to where the, they, they're very, they're very, uh, um, important. And if you piss them off, then they're going to cause a lot of problems for you and haunt you for the rest of your life. Okay. Or they could take one of your family members and take yeah. them into their world. And that's Ooh, where like people this. go when they disappear. <laughs> yeah. And, and like there was this. something about babies being left out uh, because oh, they okay. assumed. Yeah. And I think this actually plays into a Scottish, uh, we watch Outlander, the show mm. Outlander. And there's a, there's a similar tale that's Scottish where you leave the baby out because you believe that the little person came in and disguised itself as the baby and you take the oh. baby back and leave it out and they'll swap it out, you know, like if you're worthy. Line. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so many, you know, combinations of these types of stories, but I can right. see what you're saying that there's respect given because at the time it was the belief. And even now some of that still translates because this, right. they literally made this highway around this boulder today. Awesome. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's an, but that was from the podcast lore. That's where I okay. heard that from. And, that, yes. and they go down a few of those stories, but they, they just speak the story. Not really like, mm-hmm. you know, they go a little bit. Of, yeah. And they go like a little bit of historical, you know, significance, like how this, this, you know, in that particular story, how mm-hmm. this is modern, but a lot of them are, are like the bogs, uh, native American. American changeling kind of thing, like mm-hmm. the skin skinwalker kind of stuff. Yep, skinwalker. Those types of stories, you know. But you see those early on, just like you're saying, and and they were more of a moralistic guide, you know. Don't right. go out at dark. Don't you know whatever. And it's interesting though that we can't we can't totally prove right that Saint Adelthrith existed or that she right. did, had all of this happen right. to her or that Daria or she was still hot after 16 years of being dead or whatever. Right. Yeah. Sure. She was, no goiter. She was still perfect. Right. She took a good nap. But so um, in the case of Adelthrith, there are at least two authors who wrote about her. Okay. Um, one is called Alfrich, mm-hmm. Um and he was a monk in this place called Einsham. And he wrote a bunch of Saints Life stories. So he was like, he was a hagiographer. Hey okay. He, that was his bread and butter. He also did homilies and like stuff like that. I like I can that. understand what, what you said right there. I feel like I'm learning. You're a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but then another, uh, another scholar, another writer of the time period, of the same time period who wrote uh, was Bede. 
And uh, we call him the venerable bead. Okay. The venerable bead. Yeah. And no last name. He's just bead. <laughs> okay. Um, he's like share, right? Only way better <laughs> and way, probably way smarter. Right. Um, but with him, he wrote a book called the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Okay. Um, and of course it was all in Latin. So there's a Latin name for it that sure. I'm not going to go into cause I'll murder it. Um, but in the beginning of that book, the, like one of the first lines that he writes is that he has documented sources that can prove everything that's in that book. Wow. Well, all right, bead. Um, <laughs> the story of Adelthrith is in your book. Right. Where's your documented sure. history sure, sure. of Adelthrith being, you know, really having this happen to her and, you know, the goiter and, and it healing and all of this right. stuff. Because there's no like Picture eyewitness did. testimony. Picture didn't happen, right? Like yeah, <laughs> Picture didn't happen. Um, but there's no photographs. There's no um, so, so, eyewitness So accounts. the Abbey itself, does, does that still physically exist? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So is there any record there of, of any probably. of this? Probably. But it uh, still could just be- There's probably at least be... a record of Adelthrith being the abbess. Right. That might be okay. it. Okay. That might be the extent of their record. Sure. Of so this reminds me of like how we try to go back and pick apart Egyptian history because it's mm -hmm. almost like you don't know specifically, like you only have so much, maybe it's not quite like hieroglyphics on a wall, but like right. it's, it's, it's kind of in that same sense. Like you don't know- truth from, right. you know, I mean, there's probably not sun gods with like dog heads and shit, but you know, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I, I mean, can it's, totally, it's, it's a lot like trying to figure out what happened at a crime scene right. when you're not the one there. Sure. Right. You're getting these eyewitness accounts. You're getting what other people saw. Right. You're looking at footage, that kind of stuff. But without being at that time at the place, you so he was never able, sure. so bead could never actually prove. He just said that he had sources air quotes. He had his sources. Sure. Yeah. So sure. maybe God told him maybe, <laughs> maybe God told him. Um, but yeah, so he said he had documented sources for everything he ever wrote. And honestly, I believe it for most of his stuff and he sure. can, he does say what his sources are. Yeah. Um, and he's also one of the most brilliant people ever to right. exist. Um, he figured out the date of Easter, repeating for, I think it's 523 years or something like that. And Re it's still right. Huh? The date of Easter still falls. So what it was initially set as. Well, it's, it, it changes every year. Okay. Right. So the date of Easter will change every year. And I he guess I figured out the algorithm okay. essentially okay. of what that repetition is going to be. Right. And he found out that it's 500 and some odd years. Sure. It'll repeat on that same day. On the Roman calendar. Year. On the Roman calendar. Is that what calendar. we call it? The Roman yeah. calendar? Right. Okay. Yeah. On it's his very calendar. Very interesting. So, so, so circle back with me. Yep, I try to, back. I try to follow a uh, tangent as far <laughs> as we can. And then I try to circle it back. Yep. Um, so women didn't have rights. Can we, can we say that? I mean, not, um, not in, I guess the way we say now, but like, was it typical? I mean, it wasn't so much that men had rights either. either sure. Yeah. But I mean like, uh, uh, not in uh, the same typical sense. Uh, uh, would, would, would you have to go out with your husband constantly in public in order to, to be safe? more often than not. Was that like a thing or were women treated well, like, like, I don't know lonely? that it was to be safe. Sure. Um, I don't think it, most people, if you were lower class or even middle class, mm -hmm. um, you weren't really focused on like sex and things like that. It, that was just to produce children. Sure. Um, I mean, not to or say blow that there off weren't, some steam, yeah, maybe. I mean, not to say that there weren't brothels and things like that. Sure. Obviously there were. Um, but as far as like rape culture and things like that, sure. it didn't so much exist. Really? Uh, not to, not to my recollection, okay. but okay. the day in the life is not really known sure. too much. Uh, right. We have to extrapolate a lot sure, sure. from the sources that we have. Do you think that it was not as it was, it's like, like, like beating your wife wasn't even written down. It would, it Probably would be not. okay. And, and so you, th so do you think that those types of things like hey, violence, if you felt the need to do that, you were going to do it. Right. And it wasn't something yeah. that made the news to where no. we would see that. And okay. I see what you're saying. No. So maybe the, the, just the views of the time were so skewed com comparatively to now yeah, absolutely. that you almost wouldn't be able to say whether or not. I mean, but, at that point, women were property. Right. So, you okay. Know, and I guess that's ultimately what I was getting at. your father to your husband. Right. Okay. And, and there then, was very little in between. Unless you were royalty or you were rich or both, most likely. Even then. Even then. Okay. You were still your father's property that's until you were husband's property. Okay. Um, the that's women who broke affairs. out. Yeah. Those were the ones we know. Sure. Joan of Arc. Right. She broke out of that habit. Sure. Uh, saints. They right. broke away from Or the that. queens, the ones that hit queens, history and stuff yep, like that. Those sure. That did, they did whatever they wanted. They yeah. were like the original, like Beyonce, you know. Right. Like, Wait, you know, know, which is why we know them. Yeah, right? exactly. The other ones who didn't do that, we yeah. don't know who they are. 
Yeah. You know, that's, that's no. And the only reason why I ask is because I think it's awesome that you're into this, but mm -hmm. it, I'm sure it's at some points it's kind of depressing to see just how <laughs> there was no place for a person like you, even like you, yeah. you know, as an outlier, like you're slightly different than what would be yeah. considered, you know, you're like into goth stuff and things like that. I don't know what the, I probably would have been burned as a witch. Right. That's what sure. I'm saying. Like, and, and, you know, and a, and a guy like me, like, you know, I I'm constantly just talking too much and I'd probably piss somebody off because I said something bad about God or something, oh, you yeah, know? Probably. So I think our modern lifestyle, it's just so hard to put our minds into that. You as a woman, me as a guy you'd probably spend age. a lot of time in prison sure i probably would have been killed a long time ago wow okay yeah. so let's talk about old people was there was there i mean <laughs> there were no old people. there were no old people so what so an executioner was there uh for lack of a better word like assisted suicide like if you got to a point would somebody just off you or do they take you into the woods and just leave you or you know you were so exhausted in your life yeah that you just died so what's the lifespan for most in that time. I know that could range all over the place. It really can. It, I mean, if you were like in your thirties, you were old. Wow. You okay. Were really old. Okay. Um, unless you were a king okay. or a Pope sure. or something like that. So you eat good, take baths. If, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you ate well, um, if you were hygienic, if you had money, right. you could live into your fifties or sixties. If you were a monk, you could live pretty long too. Sure. Um, because <laughs> just like now, uh, the church was wealthy, right? Very, very right, wealthy. Right. Um, and, and they, you, they gave their it's like low key prison needed. because you get three straight, three meals a day. And oh, yeah, then you get like, cut, for sure. yeah, yeah. Okay. Only, I could not see Not always hot. Sure. But yeah. So you got three meals, you had a place to stay. You just had to like not talk. Right. Or whatever you're ever have sex, you know, yeah, you know never have sex, you know, um, little things, never have anything that is yours <laughs> right. that you own. Um, so if you were in a set, I own flip flops. How dare you? <laughs> Although there were some who <clears throat> I have to debate that they were like the true monk. Okay. Um, because they, they wanted to be a hermit. Okay. So there was that such a thing as a hermit. Sure. And St. Cuthbert, who we, who the church will idolize as being like the epitome of an, of a, of a monk. Um, he actually was kind of a jerk okay. as far as being a monk was concerned. I think he's a lot kind of, of hermits jerk. are like that though. Yeah. You know, because he didn't want anything to do with his monastery. Sure. He still wanted them to listen to him. Right. Um, but he didn't want to talk to them and he didn't want to be around them. Right. And he said, well, you know, to be, uh, to be closer to God and to feel the, the religious spirit, I need to be away from everything right. to me. And, and, I don't want to go off on a tip because again, I don't like to talk about a lot of, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of religion stuff, yeah. but I feel like that, that to me, I have a lot more respect than the majority of the canonized or saint, sainted folks and even modern religious folks that say that they claim one way or the other, because I feel like somebody that can, without being told to, and or be in the infrastructure of the church, like mm -hmm. a typical monastery to follow that lifestyle and do it humbly, let's say. I don't know specifically, but let's mm -hmm. say it walking in the steps of Jesus, let's say yeah. of actually being humble or, uh, you know, I feel that that is, that's, that's a legit dude, you know, sure. maybe an asshole, but <clears throat> he's living this thing that he truly believes. And, and in the sense that he doesn't need to go to a monastery or even convert right. people, like he's going to live and die by the, by this idea that's bigger than him. So it's that's kind of hot. a double-edged like sword though. <clears throat> um, so he is living this style and he is following that lifestyle that sure. he thinks will get him closer to religion. Sure. But he's also not doing the converting. He's not spreading the word in a time when it needed to be spread. So that that's like part of the job description. Is yeah. That supposed oh, to be yeah. doing that? Definitely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and another part of it is that, so he created his own hermitage okay. on an island. That These words. Was <laughs> I love this. Hermitage. It's like a village of hermits. No, no, no. Just his own little house. Okay. It so it's, like a, it's a one man village. Yeah. It's like a little hut. Hermitage. Yeah. Hermitage. It's going to be my new man, my man cave term. <laughs> this is my Welcome hermitage Welcome to my now. hermitage. <laughs> um, so, and it was on an island that you could only access. There was a land bridge that okay. you could only access during low tide. Oh, wow. Um, That's so, gangster. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> so he was definitely like, okay, I need to be on my own yeah. to feel close to God and blah, blah, blah. But I still need you to take care of me. Wow. Because I have no food. Right. And I, I don't know how I'm going to like survive over here. Right. So you need to bring me stuff. Right. Right. So the monks still had to take care of him um, and still had to help him, but they also had to still follow his rules. Right. And so he lived in this hut by himself um, and he was apparently able to like communicate with animals, okay. um, which is one of his miracles that he's associated with. I smell a tiny bit of bullshit. Just, yeah. just throwing it out there. I well, <laughs> let, let me, let me increase that smell a little bit. <laughs> So he was, at one point, one of the stories about him is that he went out into the ocean. Okay. Um, and I think he was out there at uh, daybreak or something like that. Okay. And he spent 24 hours in the water. Wow. And like- Talk about being pruning. Never came out. Oh my God. Uh, and he's in the ocean. Sure. This is England. Yeah. It's going to be cold. Um, so he's really got to be cold and he has no clothing on. 
of course. Okay. Um, but he's on his hermitage. So the only people who could possibly be looking at him were the monks. Oh, and God. So, or it's God, like thing, whatever. Sure. But so, you know, natural state, right. all that kind of stuff. So he's out in the water. He's praying. He prays for 24 hours straight. Just floating? Just, yeah, like standing there. Okay. You know, um, he didn't go out so far that he was like, you know, up to his right. neck or anything. But, you know, mid-waist sure. probably. So he could still stand. So he comes out. And at that point biologically, he's probably on the verge of hypothermia. Right. So he lays down on the beach, the shore, and two otters come out of the water and wrap themselves around him and warm him. Okay. So that he doesn't die. We're assuming otters are warm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're assuming they're warm. <laughs> We're, we're assuming that there are otters in the Atlantic. I was going to say, I didn't know. Well. I thought they were freshwater. Um, this is cool. So this is another one of those stories that 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 is take it as you will. Yep. But at the time, this was like, ooh, you know, yeah, like this is legend, right? This is true, right? Right? You right, know? right? So you smelled a little bit of bullshit. Now right. it's, <laughs> it should be a lot bigger. He yelled at birds okay. who took thatch from his roof. Okay. Um, he told them like, hey, don't take my thatch. Like, I need that. Um, mind your own business. And apparently, they came back the next day with some meat for him. And repaired his roof. An argument ensued. They felt like they were going to get in trouble. I understand. You know, he was going to go to the bird chief. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah, which is God. (laughs) Right. Um, Of course. You know, all of that, you know, uh, so there's, so, so, there's but th- this is that crazy animals. we talked about before we got on the podcast. Like yeah. there's, there's the Joan of Arc, uh, uh, like you look at the movie, uh, honestly, I've never read anything on Joan of the Arc beyond like the, what I got in, in school, mm-hmm. but you watch the movie even, and it just seems like she's just almost sick with religion. Like it's just so much in her head and there's no education, even in its most, uh, um, um, basic form Mm -hmm. to tell you that the voice in your head is probably not God. You know what I mean? Yeah. You probably have a psychological issue. Right. And I wonder how many times the church kind of just brought in psychopaths and we're like, this guy really believes in our shit. That's cool. And not realize that they're, they may actually, cause mental health was not something that was recognized at all. Right. Okay. And things like grief, somebody dies. Were you allowed to be grieving or within the the range of what religion allowed? Uh, well, within a range of time, okay. uh, you had a, a certain range that you was appropriate. Right. Um, women did the war black, all of sure. that, the, the morning, they would cry and moan crying, like the North all Korean of that. thing where they all cry, even if it's not real. Right. Uh, although there's, whoever. you know, would have been real. Like sure. the, the okay. wife would have definitely been right. okay. wailing okay. for sure. But, uh, but in terms of like, now you don't have a, you don't have a counselor to go to, uh, right. or if you're depressed, that that's not even a word back then. Right. No. Like if you're being a bitch or being lazy or, you know, right. Like you're, that would be the consideration that yeah, this person much. is lazy if they're just not able to get or, up to go to work it's or whatever. Just, that's a woman. Wow. Right? Like that's just how oh, wow. a woman sure. is. Okay. Okay. You know? I, I or guess if I didn't see that. if your dude is like temperamental or whatever, like, well, he's, you know, he needs to eat an apple right. or something, right? <laughs> he's hot. <laughs> he's too hot. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, or something like that. Or, oh, you know, she's, she's in grief. Well, yeah, her husband just died. So what is she going to do? Yeah. She probably is going to go back to her father. Right. At that point. Sure. Because that's the stabilization that a woman would have to have. You almost have to always be attached to a man at, at this time. Yes. Right. Um, although being a widow mm-hmm. is actually really good okay. for a woman at this point. Sure. Because as a, as a maiden, you're attached to your father. Okay. As a wife, you're attached to your husband. Okay. As a widow, it's like having special status right. or something, um, something like that, where now that you've been married right. and you've gone through all of that, basically hell that right. you probably went through. Cause he died. Now he died right. and he probably left you or left your kids, your sons, right. uh, some land. Sure. You now own that land. Right. And you can make decisions about that land and do whatever you want. And, and so, that, you want. so that was a protected, um, it was like situation protected for a woman. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, black widows out there. Right. <laughs> right. Like, Maybe I'm not, not sure how he but... fell over the cliff. We just went for a walk crazy. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I'd like my room redone in, in bru- uh, uh, blue. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Hemlock is a poisonous plant. I thought it was just an herb that I could he, He's, Put in my stew. He was foaming around the mouth before I saw him today. I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> Must have had the rabies. <laughs> yeah, rabies weren't a thing. So speaking of, of that, healthcare. Uh, uh, we did talk about how physicians are basically ridiculous and they had no idea, but nobody's going to the doctor for checkups. No. It, it was only if something came up, right? Yeah, if you got sick. Okay. I heard inoculation came on early where where they would they learned that they could inoculate against things like, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something up here, but probably like smallpox, where you could take somebody that 
got over it, right? Or, mm-hmm. or had it and then they infected. I don't know, know how it's, it's comparable to a vaccine, but it's not necessarily a vaccine to inoculate somebody. But were they doing that at this, uh, in this era at all? Like trying to get ahead of the curve? You know, not that I'm aware of. I don't know much about the medical history in okay. the Middle Ages. Um, definitely not in the early Middle Ages. Sure. Because um, there was no understanding. That There was very little understanding. I mean, there was work being done. Yeah. Um, there was scientific progress sure. being made in the fields of medicine. But they were still working with that four humors theory sure. idea. that and Because that persisted all the way into the Victorian era. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Cause it I, really did. Because I listened to... Uh, it went way too long. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to forget her name and I'm going to hate myself. Fitzsimmons on the Joe Rogan podcast, the one I was telling you about. Okay. Um, and she talked about how that was part of the barbershop poll was that the barbers would actually be the blood letters yep. as well as well as doctors where the red or, 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 or as well as barbers right yep. so so you would go to the barbershop to essentially like cure an ailment yep. and, and and then get a haircut and get a haircut yep. right <laughs> and and it, and she went a step further to talk about like kind of drew like a, a grim uh, a v- vision of like that era being more like uh city and like dirty and gross that these barbers would keep bowls of blood like in the front shop windows to show mm. that this is what we do and this is you know and it would just congeal and get nasty oh, and yeah. they eventually had to make laws to get people to stop doing that and stuff mm-hmm. like that but i think it's interesting you say that because i didn't realize it was as prevalent like that that so that's from 400 to 1500 for your era yep. and this the victorians like 1600 1700 1800 how uh, far does that go it's, it's like uh, i think it's 17th late 17th century maybe because i'm trying to think of where shakespeare falls in that he's 16th century so then victorians would have been the 17th century sure yeah. so so essentially they're still doing this stuff so so mm-hmm. healthcare just didn't move that much i mean not as not as fast as you would want it right. to it wasn't until much later when you know biology and chemistry started becoming sure. um uh, known, right. <laughs> right? Invented, right, right. I guess, that people were actually like, oh, there's stuff inside like, the blood. Right. And if we boil like it liquid. before we eat it, we might not die. That's weird. Right. <laughs> Even if we cook these things, we may not, you know, feel terrible afterwards. So there's no government uh, coming around passing out pamphlets like syphilis is real. Don't, fuck, <laughs> no. don't, don't like have sex with just random things or no. animals because that was a thing, right? Yeah, like that's was a thing. Right. And that's where uh, STDs came from from maybe we're maybe i'm speaking out of that of i don't term. know I, that's what i've been told is that like the close proximity of 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 humans and animals being that they lived in the houses that a lot of these diseases came from cross cr- there's definitely like hoof and mouth disease that would right. have gotten passed along sure for but, sure but then it, then in a but brothel, i don't know about um stds or anything right like the that, origin yeah. right and i know that you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to speak specifically on that but like if you go into a brothel in the medieval time. Yeah. Is it likely that you'd come out with an STD? Probably. Really? Okay. Yeah. So that was, that was prevalent. It was a dangerous well. thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You don't want to go to a brothel. Right. Um, even if you were like desperate for it, like it, don't go into the brothel. There's no condoms. There's there no, wouldn't be condoms. There they didn't do be... sheep's bladder. I've heard like random. It's not uh, a thing. I, th- I think it's a thing. I don't know how prevalent it was. Sure. Um, but you know, there wasn't like STD checks or sure. anything. I guess if a woman looked diseased, they wouldn't let her be, a whore i don't know right um or you know if the guy just didn't care right um or if he had one already he didn't care about passing it along sure he just want to get his goodies off before he dies or pretty whatever. much sure. um but brothels would have also been very dangerous places okay uh money changing hands right so anytime that there's a situation where there's money exchange and then a lot a lot of people uh-huh. that's just setting you up for getting stabbed right pretty much um so not only is there the the health side of it but there's also just the danger side right. of going so it's into probably this building. so it's more of a young man's game oh yeah 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 oh, okay well i mean i'm sure old men went in well there too, and but... we were saying earlier like old is like 30 35. yeah yeah so sure. maybe a 40 year old was going yeah in there and, yeah you know. like get grandpa you know okay i <laughs> yeah, see that absolutely so so sex let's talk sex real quick so what was that viewed like in the medieval ages like what don't was do it. don't do it don't do it really <laughs> don't do it <laughs> okay and, if and, you want to be a good christian don't do it don't do it now if you're married you you you're, you're only do it to make kids wow okay okay and th- and this is where like you get the whole uh um uh, what do they call and it very like, little of that has changed along well sure but like know, but like uh, things like like uh anything outside of like missionary sex was considered super taboo right and you just didn't yeah. talk about anything oh anything. yeah you definitely didn't talk about it um I don't know about positions so much, right, but, but in, I mean, the, in the brothels, that would have been like where you right. went to 
explore. Right. And and at this time, like the Karma Sutra, um, did I say that word right? Yeah. Karma Sutra. Karma Sutra. That, that was a thing, but in another part England. of the world, right? Yeah. Because that, that wouldn't was, have been in England. So the, uh, culturally speaking, England, medieval times, sex was still considered to be something that was very private behind doors. Sure. Yeah. You wouldn't have women wearing low cut things. Was that kind of a thing? Like trying to walk around? No. no. I mean, okay. it, women didn't care women. about being flashy or, okay. or being seductive or yeah. attractive. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't a thing. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, okay, most marriages or most relationships were convenience. Right. Um, family to family. Family to family. Hooking um, up the kids from a widow or something. Right. Sure. Or something okay. like that. If it, if it was um, the wealthy or if it was the royalty, right. then it would have been um, a matter of the marriage consecrating a relationship between two lands. Right. Um, so there's just no choice there for a woman. That's treaties. what makes me so sad about that. Yeah. Like it's just like you're hooked up before you're even like 15 or something. Cause yeah. you're getting married real early. Even before that. Yeah. Oh my God. It, it, sometimes it's from birth. Wow. You like you are the, the daughter of this King. You want to, they want to make peace with this guy. Well, we're going to say that, okay, his son is going to marry you. When and, you're and or he has no heir. You're marrying the 60 year old King. That could be too. Jesus. Yeah. That's a, that's a tense. I mean, you yeah. see, and the reason why, like I'm asking, I guess what would be almost obvious thing things in certain cases, but I feel like with the media's portrayal, cause I just watch movies. I don't go to the school and mm-hmm. study medieval things, you know? Yeah. So I'm just curious, like how much of this am I tracking on that? That sounds right. Cause I, apparently I have an interest in the medieval times, sure, but yeah. I'm just not in a, in a way that I would be able to speak authoritatively. Mm-hmm. I think this is really cool. It's very, it's very eye opening to me on, yeah. on certain things. Well, like there that. are some scholars too. Um, and actually one of my dissertation committee members, um, has studied sex in the middle ages pretty huh. extensively, sure. um, as well as fertility right. and things like that. Um, um, and what uh, fluids, sexual fluids, how they were considered. Um, huh. And I don't know a whole lot about it. Okay. She would know way more than I do. Okay. Um, but how semen was considered and how vaginal fluid was considered. and the Like it was gross or the, like it was... Not so much how, like if it was gross or not, um, but like the like a meaning behind it, right? You know, so you don't want to spill your seed, right? Without it being productive. Okay. Kind of so thing. unless you're making a baby, yeah. like, okay. So yeah, like so the that... porn industry would not be a thing back no. then. Okay. Yeah. Cause no. it's a lot of waste. I <laughs> yeah. Guess. So much waste, so much waste. Um, and, and so many just terrible unreligious women in yeah. that and, and terrible unreligious men. Sure. That's um, a sacrilege. Yeah. yeah Everybody'd yeah, be definitely. burned at the stake. Definitely. Crucifixions are coming back left and right. Plus, We don't want to get back to the pagans <laughs> sure. where a lot of pagan rituals might right, have included belief. some kind of some like kind of sex. sexuality. To right, it. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. So the Christians definitely were like, Oh my God, no. Yeah. You know, that's so insane to me because I, I I know you know I don't know enough about it, but I know when the the big transition from paganism to you know like Roman Catholic, but mm-hmm. basically to Christianity yeah. was it was just it, they were just throwing women out the door left and right in terms of any having any importance in the church. Yeah, but it was so sexualized for pagans, but almost. You know, I don't, I don't think I could be wrong, but, uh, I don't think that rape was considered to be okay, but sex was considered to be okay. And this is before you had these like real conservative times that came up, you know, after the, the Christianity. Yeah. So it's interesting to see how sex was viewed. Then nowadays you can see girls wearing like, you know, a swimsuit walking around a bikini mm-hmm. top and stuff. It's all good. You know what I mean? And yeah. there's rules in place where cares. you can't grab that girl and rape her. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, absolutely. Then, and then you have healthcare in place to not get STDs it's in case so where she's yeah. wanting to actually have sex. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I, I feel like it's, it's just, it's such a big change in, in how things are viewed. So- I know in the, in the later middle ages as well, um, there are documents, um, where we start getting legal documents and court documents, um, that are actually written down. Okay. Uh, and they're mostly in like Latin or French, things like that. But, um, Chaucer, our buddy, the okay. author, um, he, there's actually a document of him being accused of rape. Oh, wow. But the term rape didn't always necessarily have a sexual connotation to it. Um, so if you've ever heard of the story, the rape of the lock, um, it has to do with hair and basically it just means thievery. Okay. So actually like stealing a lock of hair. Sure. Um, so the, one of the things that's kind of unclear about some of these documents is what did Chaucer actually do? Right. Um, cause they're speaking in a, in like almost the poetic. So they're not getting as specific as they could. Kind of, but I mean, or these like legal documents were, they were definitely higher up, like right. very high echelon level, uh, language, but they don't go into ex- explicit sure. about like, here's the situation that we're talking about. Right. It's just, here's the accused. Here's what he's accused of. Right. Um, and so it says like Jeffrey Chaucer rape. Yeah. And then uh, he had like a fine right. or something like that. And it's like, Insane. well, fa- the fine probably wouldn't be for a sexual crime. Sure. It'd probably um, be so, more for like stealing hair or something like right, you're saying. Some sure. kind of okay. thievery. Um, he, That's ridiculous that you could Chaucer's just take that very, as such a general term. You know? Yeah. Chaucer was a weird guy. He did a lot of stuff. Yeah. In addition to being a writer. Did the Knight's Tale have it nailed at all? 
Did it have what? Uh, did it have his character nailed at all? <laughs> I mean, granted, um, he, I feel like it was more of a comedic version of him. There was definitely a comedic version. Right. Um, but was he kind of like that? Like I kind of a Paul vagabond Bentley type? As Chaucer. Right. Um, Perfect. That's all I see when I hear Chaucer. Yeah. I just see, you know, he to was... trudge the, the term, <laughs> you know, like just the way he, kill, he killed trudge, it in that role. To trudge, yeah. you know, the act of trudging. <laughs> and they just yeah, look at him, what? It. What is it? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, and he just looks at them like, ugh. Right. Freaking but naked though, sitting there yeah, by himself. Absolutely butt naked. You know, reminds um, me of like the, the artist, the starving artist. Yeah, absolutely. sorry, and go he ahead. Was, <laughs> he was. Um, I, as far as characterization, um, I think Paul Bettany was a bit taller okay. than Chaucer. Uh, I like how that's where you go with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a picture that was drawn in the manuscript of okay. uh, the Canterbury Tales, okay. and he he looks kind of short, sure. and he's on a very squat horse. Okay, uh, so I think he was a bit he was a bit shorter and a bit stouter. Sure. Um, but as far as the character goes, um, I don't think he was quite as snarky or okay. anything like that. Yeah. He had his humor that he put into his stories. Right. right. Uh, the man himself, I think he was very worldly sure. and just, um, uh, made his way for his time was very cultural. Like now yeah. we have the internet and the internet yeah. makes almost anybody that is willing to, you know, open their brain a little bit. You could be cultural, but to have somebody like that back then, he'd well, and he had one wealthy of royalty, pay, uh, um, patrons. Okay. So in order to get those patrons and keep them happy, sure. you probably don't want to piss them off right. um, by doing stupid things right. and doing things like, you know, raping somebody. Right. right? So they would have found out about that and sure. probably Not discontinued be with them. Sure. their patronage. Um, so he didn't want to make people angry like that. He did want to make people angry in his stories, though, right. which is so much fun. So he's read. like one of the godfathers of like Gonzo writing and like off the wall kind of stuff yeah. where, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Cause, it, sure. Cause his stuff was never tr really true. It was mostly fictional right like maybe he talked yeah. about situations that he was in but the glamorized yeah. him a bit didn't he yeah okay. he definitely uh he definitely wrote fiction um his his pilgrims were all made up even okay. though some of them had names right and some of them might have had some kind of relation L like he says in the, in the movie a likeness right where yeah. he says i will i will put you into the annals of fiction forever and ever like yes i so it's I so, will write you into the annals of fiction right, and, and and make you a laughing stock right. for the rest of I your life. I love that. I love that that concept because that's so that's so cool to think that he didn't even let's say he didn't say that, but if he did, it, then he you know he didn't even know he was going to be essentially put mm -hmm. in there with like Shakespeare in yeah, terms of like absolutely. you know how important he is. So anybody that pissed him off really was yeah. you know the guy where those people would have never even been mentioned otherwise. You know they would have yeah. never. Um, and some later authors, um, the one. Poet who I like, um, John Wilmot. He's the second Earl of Rochester, which nobody needs to know or nobody should know. Yeah. Um, but they made a movie about him okay. starring Johnny Depp called The Libertine. The Libertines. Yeah. yeah. Another one. I don't know and if I've ever seen that. He's a poet. Uh, I think he's in the 18th or 19th century. Um, so much, much later than the medieval period. But his poetry is so lewd and so crass and really kind of disgusting. So kind of like, uh, uh, uh Anne Rice. Uh, no, no, More, not that dirty. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, it was, it was pretty bad. Okay. It was pretty, pretty especially nasty. for then that would have been whoa. almost pornographic okay. uh, to that point. Um, but he made fun of the King in his poetry That's because brave. he hated the King. He right. hated King Charles so much that he put Charles into his poetry in these terrible lewd acts um, that may or may not be true. Right. And um, of course he died of syphilis. Uh, <laughs> You know what's fun about syphilis too, and I, just to, to tangent. Nothing is fun about syphilis. No, no, no. Listen, it gets better, right? <laughs> so they, they talked about in that podcast about uh, how people that, and this is of course Victorian era, so not your not what we're talking about here, but your your nose would fall off. That yep. was one of the tall tale signs. Yep, um, definitely um, true. And they would actually give you rubber replacements, not rubber, but whatever they Some could. Some kind of prosthetic. Not in your yep. time, but of course, further on, 1700s, 1800s, where they were able to have the chemical mixture to make things that were like that. Mm -hmm. But then you'd get holes in the top of your head too. So yeah. syphilis was a lot of fun for that. Sorry, syphilis I just, just wanted ate to- away at you. Yeah. yeah. So that was a tall tale sign if you're going to mess with a, a prostitute. Yeah. You know, hey, yeah. that nose is looking a little- She does have a nose. Yeah. Um, and actually, going back to a medieval story though, that does have to do with noses and falling off, about a werewolf okay. uh, written by a French woman who just calls herself Marie. 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 Um, so we call her Marie de France. Okay. So it just means Marie of France. Okay. Um, and she wrote a book of these short romantical stories called Lays. Okay. Um, and called Lays. Yeah. I love it. And so uh, one of her Lays is called Bisclavre. So of course that's French. And it's just a fancy word that means werewolf. Okay. 
But her main character of the story is also called Biz Club Ray. Okay. So there's a little B and there's a capital B sure. uh, in the story, which <laughs> always confuses my students at first when we read the story. Right. But so what happens... One of those little sneaky things you throw in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely a teacher. I like um, it. <laughs> so what happens throughout the story is that um, Biz Club Ray uh, changes into a werewolf and he does this weekly, okay. which is a different version than what the usual werewolf lore once is. a month is typical right the full moon okay now we get every weekend okay um so he goes off for three days okay. does his werewolfy thing and then comes back and his wife is starting to get suspicious huh. and it's just like what are you doing yeah right um so automatically she thinks he's having an affair right right which makes most sense um and he goes i'm not having an affair i love you just don't ask me what I'm doing yeah. because you're going to hate me right. if I tell you. So blah, blah, blah. She keeps nagging at him. Finally, he tells her. He goes, well, I'm a werewolf. I turn into a werewolf. I have to go into the wo- the woods so nobody kills me and I just need to be alone. Right. Eat squirrels. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. Sure. Um, and she goes, well, she wants to know if he's clothed when he changes. Okay. Like in his werewolf form. It's and definitely he, a, w- a wife question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a random question. And right. my students are always just like, what? What? <laughs> cares about his clothes sure. he gets fur <laughs> so my wife would ask me like do you have your shirt off mm-hmm. right um so he says no i have to take my clothes off but i keep them in this very particular spot so that when i have to change back i know where my clothes are right um so that's his tie to his humanity and it's his tie to civilization sure. and things like that so that becomes a big theme throughout the rest of the story well of course by asking him that we know this is going to come back later in the story. Right. So she's freaking out because she can't have a werewolf husband. Like it's just, you can't do it. The idea of a werewolf were these big monstrous, crazy blood, you know, flesh ripping things. things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she's like, I can't sleep next to this man. He's going to eat me. Yeah. Right. Um, and in, you know, in a bad way. And, (laughs) 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 and, um, so she makes a deal with her neighbor who's in love with her to steal her husband's clothes when he becomes a werewolf the next time. And so the guy next door. Oh, so this is nefarious on the wife's part. Sure, sure, sure. So the guy next door is like, yeah, I'll do that for you. No problem. And she's like, all right, great. I'll marry you if you do this. Wow. Yeah. So quid pro quo. Right. And so he does it, steals the clothes. And now Biz Club Ray is stuck as a werewolf. As a werewolf. So he's in the woods. He gets picked up by the king. Okay. And the king's like, wait, don't kill this guy. Like, don't kill this thing. He's, it, there's something about him. Okay. And so he like, he kneels at the king's feet. He kisses the king's feet. And he's like, okay, there's something weird about this wolf. Let's take him home. Yeah. Right. And he's like, hey, wifey. I found a dog. Can we keep him? Right. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so he becomes, man-sized dog. He becomes the king's pet. Okay. And eventually throughout the course of the story, uh, both the woman, the wife, who's never named, and her new lover okay. um, eventually end up at the king's house, huh. at his palace. Okay. And they see the wolf. And the wolf sees them. And the wolf sees this man, her, her lover, and lunges at him huh. and it's just like what is going on with our wolf yeah right this is totally out of character then later on in the story the woman is there by herself and of course biz Club Ray sees her freaks out again and actually goes over to her and rips her nose off Ooh. and they're you know they're trying to restrain him and all this stuff and figuring out what's going on and so even though her nose has been ripped off nobody seems to care about it and they just want to know why the wolf is freaking out <laughs> And so they interrogate her. They wow. like they literally put her on trial and they interrogate her to figure out what's wrong with our wolf. Yeah. And so eventually she cracks and she's like, okay, this is really my husband, blah, 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 tells the whole story. Sure. Here's where we hid his clothes. All he needs is his clothes back and he'll Turn go back, back into, into a wolf form. And so they they get his clothes, give it to him. He goes and has privacy. He goes into a chamber to put his clothes on. Okay. The and wolf. They, the wolf. <laughs> and they leave him alone for about two hours and he falls okay. asleep. Like he's, he's just napping on a totally bed. It's just totally a medieval story. Yeah. It just gets weird. <laughs> it's so I'm weird. He's a nap now. <laughs> he's taking a nap and they go in and check on him and he's back in human form. Okay. He's fully clothed, yeah. all this stuff. And so they exile the woman, his former wife. No nose. No nose. Okay. And her former lover. And now she's also cursed. So she's got this werewolfian curse that any female descendant that she might have will be deformed with the lack of a nose. Wow. Her sons won't, okay. but any daughter she has will not have a nose. Wow. So uh, we interpret this as being like, okay, well, the wife is bad and you know she's gotten her just desserts for that. But there's also that, that overlying idea of, okay, if you don't have a nose, 
you might be associated with some kind of sexuality. Oh, wow. You might have some kind of prostitution sure. behind you, sure. something like that, that whole syphilis idea. So in a way, Marie de France is also kind of commenting on this. Hey, you know, don't do s- stupid shit when your husband tells you things like That's this. really cool, though, because that speaks to like even modern times where the our authors will do that. Like yeah. they'll take something happening and, and um, find a way to build that into a story essentially, mm-hmm. you know, and syphilis was probably the main culprit. Like you said, that kind of influenced yeah. the way that she, she, she depicted the the deformity. So That's really I, cool. you know, I love these kinds of <clears throat> weird stories, the things that happen that are just off the wall. Right. Um, and actually there's, there was one, um, occurrence, if I might tell another anecdote. Okay. That is yeah, absolutely. Super fun. No, we don't have any time limits. I, I was just <laughs> totally trying to, I want to make sure that I wasn't trying to ask you the same questions. Cause like I looked down my list and I'm like, I think we answered that. I think yeah, no, no, you're that. good. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm, I'm totally literature based, right. um, but with the way that the degree is, it's very interdisciplinary. Sure. So I can comment on some of the historical stuff cause I had a lot of history and I can comment on some of the cultural stuff right. and language and things like that. So, well, I like that you're, you're, you're read through literature though, because mm-hmm. that's really the, the, the only real source of a lot of these things where I'm going to be read on Beowulf through a movie. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. Go ahead. Continue. Um, so One of the, one of a historical anecdotes that I incorporated into one of my chapters in my dissertation, um, about, uh, the chapter is about non hagiographical texts. So things that don't have to deal with saints lives, but still have a religious bend to them. Um, I started out the chapter by talking about this anecdote about a former Pope. Okay. Uh, who was Pope from ni- uh, 891 to 897. Okay. And so he had a very short papacy. Right. But what happened during his papacy makes it like one of the craziest legendary things that has ever happened okay. that nobody knows about. Um, so the Pope is called Formosus. Okay. So he's Pope Formosus. That sounds pretty gangster. And <laughs> Formosus. He was originally, um, so he became a, a cardinal bishop. And so he had his bishopric and all that stuff. And then there was some political happenings that went down and some folks liked him. Some folks hated him that were in power, religious power. Right. Um, he got on the bad side of a few people who were really, really important. Okay. And the Pope did the Pope did. Huh. Well, no, he wasn't Pope yet. Oh, sure. Uh, he I'm was, on still, the same a, page. He was okay. still a cardinal bishop. Okay. Um, but he decided to, make a few changes and elect a few people that were not really supposed to get put into power. This sounds a little Hitlerish. Just saying. That's kind of no, no, how he's he a good person. He's a good person. He's a good okay. person. Oh, so he's making positive he's changes. He's making positive changes. Okay, good. Good. Things that the other folks didn't like because they were positive right. changes. Um, he was also a fan of Charles II or Charlemagne. Okay. Um, and these other folks were not. Okay. Uh, so that kind of divided him. So he eventually uh, became the successor of Stephen the sixth okay. or fifth, one of those two. Um, so he became his successor. He uh, rose to the papacy and throughout his very short papacy, uh, more of these changes kept going on, okay. still pissing people off right. that he probably shouldn't have pissed off. And eventually he died. Okay. So none of that really sounds all that crazy or all that fun. Um, but what they did after he died is what ha- is what makes it so interesting is that um, his successor was Stephen the seventh. Okay. Right? Cause these are all, you know, something the seventh or right. something the second. Or they whatever. got tired of the juniors. They just started counting with numbers. Yeah. Uh, this was first. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so it's very hard to keep track of who's who. Sure. Um, so Stephen the seventh comes to power and says, well, I don't like this Formosus guy. And I don't like the fact that he got buried in his papal vestments and with all the honors that are due a Pope. Right. Let's dig him up. Oh no. So, (laughs) yeah. So they exhumed the Pope. The Pope. Right. Gets exhumed. You never, I've never heard of that. From his eternal resting place. Wow. Right. Even if you're not a religious thing, that's a, a big faux pas. Yeah, unless you have a bit of like a good reason. A good reason, That's not a good right? Reason. <laughs> um, crime scene stuff or yeah. something like that, right? Evidence. Um, so they dig him up and they put him on trial. Dead. Yeah, he, it's a corpse. Wow. They prop him up. I can see how this uh, interested you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they called this trial the okay. Cadaver Synod. Huh. And a synod is just a fancy word for a meeting. Okay. And this is another metal band. If you're yeah. listening, Cadaver that's awesome. Synod, get out there, make <laughs> the band. The night, bro. You got to have a, a, a song about Formosus, though. <laughs> right. um, so they prop him up, this corpse, 
And they had a deacon stand in for him as his speaker. Wow. Slash defender. Okay. The prosecutor came up and actually interrogated the Pope. Wow. The dead Pope. And of course, because um, the deacon was a moron and didn't actually say anything, yeah. like he was supposed to defend or at least speak for Formosus, but he just kind of stood there. Huh silent and he didn't say anything i feel like that may be more honest than trying to like defend a dead guy you know what i mean because you're just Maybe. making shit up you know be like, probably <laughs> but i mean everyone knew what formosus did and right. there were people who de- who backed him up sure sure um but so the, po- the bishop just stayed silent the prosecutor is interrogating him and i think it might have been the current pope that was okay. doing this sure um and so because there was no defense he got found guilty Wow. And so he got found guilty of crimes against canon law. Okay. Which was basically, he put someone into power. He he made um, Charles II, I believe, emperor. Okay. And nobody liked that. And then but he, it wasn't illegal. No. Okay. Uh, and then he put someone else in as another emperor in a different country. Huh. And nobody liked that because nobody liked him. Sure. And that supposedly went against canon law. Um, there were other things that uh, he he was accused of perjury and found guilty of perjury. Um, and then he was also found guilty of claiming to be a religious authority when he actually wasn't. Can you just imagine like the crowd standing there and they're just like looking at him, arms crossed or just shaking their head. You son <laughs> of a bitch. Shame. Yeah. You know, like, For shame. For like, shame. What do you go? What, what is the goal here? You know? So he got found guilty of all these crimes. Right. Of course. And because of that. While he was on the stand, they stripped him of his papal vestments down to just the the white uh, garments that okay. he would have worn underneath. They cut off the three fingers that he used to consecrate and bless people. Wow. So if you've ever seen um, a religious text or illumination or the Pope going like this, sure. those are his religious fingers. Right, right. You know, and I'm, I'm holding up my two, uh, my index and middle finger and then my thumb. Um, and those are the, the religious blessing fingers sure. for the Pope. So they cut those off. Huh. And <laughs> they took his, his papal crown and things like that. Um, and they decided, well, we're just going to bury you in a pauper's grave. Wherever, yeah. Wherever. Well, they didn't think that was good enough either. So they dug his body up from wherever it was going to get buried, a shallow grave. Mm-hmm. And they threw it in the Tiber River. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. So this is almost like, I see about, like, you may not go there with this, but what I'm seeing right now is I feel like we're about to have an Imhotep situation. Does he come back? <laughs> is he running around, building no, his body back up? No, no Imhotep <clears throat> situation. He doesn't, he doesn't reanimate, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but uh, someone does find him on the Tiber, and they bring him back to the church. And as much as they can, they give him a quote unquote proper burial, even for a religious figure. Wow. Everybody knows who he is. Right. right. So they know he's an important figure. It's interesting. Well, after Stephen dies, another Pope comes up and I think it's Theodore. He had a very short, I think six or nine month reign. Um, and cause the Popage is Popage. What do you call it? Papacy. The papacy is usually life, right? Like you yeah. go until you're dead. Yeah. Right? Once okay. you're dead, once you're elected Pope, you're, wow. you're that until you die. I feel like it's a curse at this point. It, you know, these guys be. are not getting very long. <laughs> yeah. So Theodore is only in power for like six months, but in that six months, um, he says the cadaver synod was stupid. And so he reinstates, uh, Formosus in his, in his papacy. And just said, on paper is what the thing Well, is. he had been excommunicated. Right. Um, Formosus had. And so he said, he goes, Nope. That for that excommunication is gone. Everything that you guys accused him of and and found him guilty of is wrong. Right, wipe it um, out. So he wiped his slate clean, and he goes, "We need to rebury this guy in in proper papal vestments and right. all like of the that. other popes." Yeah, Do it correctly. Okay. So go back in time, however many months, and put him back in his grave in the proper way. Um, and you know, if we have those fingers, maybe put him back. Wow. But I don't think they had the fingers yeah. anymore. Um, so then. That seems like the end of the story. Okay. But there's a possibly apocryphal secondary version of this. Speak to me. What's this word? Apocryphal uh, may or may not have happened. Oh. Uh, So there's like apocryphal. Is that an old English word? It's it's one now. Uh, It's a word now. Apocryphal. Apocryphal. Spell it. Uh, A-P-O-C-H. 
R A P H A L. I think apocryphal. apocryphal. Yeah. You guys heard it. I'm gonna start using that. And it, it means what wrong. again? Uh, something may or may not be happened. It may or may not have happened, but it when you was. Use that in IT. So we'd be like, "What's happening? Here? I mean, it's apocryphal. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll know later. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. You know. So there are um, like the the uh, in the Bible they say that there's an apocryphal book of Judas. Okay. Right. So okay. it may or may not exist. Like the whole Bible could really be apocryphal. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Well, it exists. It exists. We just don't know uh, if what happened. What's in it, in it is true. sure. Sorry, yeah. continue. So the I'm, book of Judas may or may not exist. Right. Uh, people say it did. Okay. So apocryphal story uh, that comes second is that the next pope who comes after Theodore resigned again and said, "No, what they did originally was right." Wow. So forget Theodore and forget his proclamations. Yeah. Dig him up again. Wow. <laughs> and so they dug him up again and put him on trial again. We're talking about bones, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this would have been bones. This is ridiculous. <laughs> um, well, first wouldn't have been bones because he was only dead for about nine months. Okay. So probably would have still been pretty My fleshy. My good God. Imagine that smell. At this point, Ooh. it might have been bones. Yeah. Um, it was probably bones. Because this was years later. Um, and they, so they found him guilty again supposedly. <laughs> um, and then, so he got put back in just to a pauper's grave, but that part may or may not have happened. Sure. So that was the apocryphal part, but I started out my chapter that way. Um, because I wanted to showcase how corpses were used or incorporated right. into certain stories sure. that weren't just a hero's tale or a saint's life tale. Right. Um, and then I went into several other different stories. That well, the Pope about- would have been, I mean, for lack of a better word, the most powerful man in the world, right? Yep. Because, I mean, we had snuffed out most other religions, so the one that was everywhere was Christianity, and the Pope's the boss, right? I mean, that was like the deal. Yep. Okay. That's insane to me. That's that, You know, and, and what, what, what it adds to that, too, is the fact that, like you said, they treat the body in a way that's like a product. It's not even like, this is the Pope. You'd think that they would be, they would feel it's so holy that you just don't mess with it, like you're getting to get cursed. Right. You know what I mean? But once you excommunicate someone, sure. all that holiness goes right out the window. I love these words that humans use. You know, they put all these fences around things. You say, yeah. you know, and then the next guy comes along, he's like, no, that's not a thing. And then, oh, well, now we can change how we feel about that yep. same subject or person or whatever. You yeah, know, that's, absolutely. So it's just like one Pope to the next, all changing ideas and, and what was true, what wasn't true, right. what's right, what's not right. It was, it was a crazy time, the ninth century in Rome. So speaking to, uh, let's take it all and, and, and 10,000 foot view this stuff. Yeah. I, I said it, Emilio. I say it too much in my podcast. My buddy okay. always calls me. Out. Actually, I didn't say 30,000 foot. See, uh, but take this all together. <clears throat> what's something Somebody who doesn't have an interest, but some you're trying to maybe talk to your first, you got a class comes in first yeah. couple of days. Sure. <clears throat> what's the biggest thing that you would, <clears throat> if uh, uh, my throat would work, what's the <laughs> biggest thing that somebody should take away? Like the biggest difference between medieval life and comparatively to now, what's the biggest thing that you think people would um, not think of, or maybe take it for granted, I guess. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think the literacy concept is, is really big and that's probably my biased view because I'm a, you know, literature person. Um, I mean, we could see the technology differences. Those are pretty obvious. We can see the life, you know, daily life kind of thing. And the Um, rights kind of stuff like we're talking about, like you and I are equals in this age where we wouldn't have been in the past in terms of like how we're viewed in society. Yeah. Humanitarianism and, um, ideas about, you know, um, rights for women or rights for men, um, that kind of thing. It, it, it was so very clearly based on your political stance, your religious stance, and then how much wealth you had. Sure. Um, maybe not so different than now, but (laughs) yeah, no, this is true. This is true. But thankfully, um, women have, you know, a lot of rights now, which yes, is good, very much so. and we need to keep them. Right. Um, but for I think for me, one of the biggest things is that a lot of students and a lot of just the general public thinks that because we have these texts written down, that they were as prevalent written down in the Middle Ages as we have them now. Right. We can go to Barnes and Noble or we can go to Amazon and say, I want this book today. Sure. And or you your could, phone. Hell. Or your phone. And yeah. you could download it to your, your phone or a tablet or whatever. And you could read that text right now. Sure. Or, you know, go to the store and buy it right now. Um, if you wanted to read in the Middle Ages, that was a, a huge undertaking. Hmm. Um, books were super expensive. Huh. And that's why they're so rare. Because they're handwritten. They're handwritten. Sure. Um, but we also didn't have paper. Okay. Um, so hmm. instead of paper, we had parchment or vellum. Okay. And to make parchment or vellum, it comes from animal hide. 
Huh. And so the process, and I'm not going to go into the process because it's really gross, um, but the process of taking a sheep or a cow or a goat and removing the skin and turning it into something that's able to be written on yeah. is a very lengthy, very expensive, right. and a very specific process. Well, and you'd only have so many pages out of a cow. You'll only you have know? so many pages. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, so to create uh, one of the biggest Bibles we have. It's a huge, like hundred pound volume. Wow. Um, and it's not even the complete Bible. It's sure. not the full thing. Um, that would have taken herds of animals herds. to create. Wow. Um, because of how much paper you will need, I'll, I'll call it paper, but parchment, sure. uh, you need how much, um, text you're going to put on it. So it's a very calculated, uh, precise. You're thing. essentially measuring said skin. Once you take it off the animal, right. making sure you can make as much and you're, as you're needing. You're, you're making it look like a square rather than like, you know, things that have like pointy Random parts shape. and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're hoping that you've stretched it and tanned it well enough and gotten the hair off well enough that yeah. it lasts. Um, then they had to make their own ink. Sure. Um, out. It's like charcoal, some shit like that. No, not so much charcoal. Um, it would have been uh, what they call galls, okay. uh, which are only on certain trees. Okay. And they're just these the little balls that form on trees that hang down. Huh. And they would pick them and they would essentially smush them okay. into a workable ink. Wow. There's a little bit more to it, but... So, the, so, so, were there ever that. any human skin books or is that all legend as well? We don't have like Supposedly, a book of the day. Supposedly, Harvard... Uh, library has three books no shit. that are completely bound in human skin. Wow. Do we, know, do we know who these humans were? Nothing. I, I don't know anything sure. about them. Sure. They weren't them, super actually. important. It's going to be my thought. <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's not like their face. Right. right? It's not like the Necronomicon uh, from Army <laughs> right, of Darkness. Okay, that's kind of where I was going. Okay, cool. Cool. <laughs> so it's probably not, not like a face that's going to, you know, bite at bite you your or hand. something. Yeah. yeah it's or not like the Harry Potter monster book thing. So, so education, that's a big one. Cause yeah. I feel like even now, um, you know, people can argue what they want about religion, but I think that, uh, even if you're religious, there's, you know, some very, it's, you can't, to, are we, you and I vastly more educated than we would have been? Oh, definitely. Fi- okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, I mean the fact that we can read and write. Right. Um, so most people could not read or write. No. Okay. No, 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 no. So that, I feel like that would be the biggest takeaway. Only the, the, very, very wealthy sure. or royal uh, people could actually read and write. Um, you had to have a tutor in order to do that. There right. was no like school. School, right. Okay. Um, okay. So middle class, lower class, they would never have even thought about writing or no, owning a book. No university. University was a concept that wasn't there yet? <sighs> Not until much, much later. Okay. Um, definitely during the old English period, no. Okay. Um, one of our, one of the biggest and most important kings was King Alfred. Okay. And he wanted to institute um, a re revitalization of the education system huh. um, for, of course, the wealthy. Right. And because, <laughs> and the monks, the religious, they had to learn how to read and write sure. as well in Latin. Right. Right. So not just the vernacular, not just what you really regularly so they could spoke. copy Bibles though, right? Like that's really <laughs> pretty much. So you could copy Bibles. So you could write down religious poetry. Sure. Um, so you could copy saints, life stories, things like that. Um, spread the word, right. um, even just writing down prayers. Right. That was a big thing sure, so sure, that, sure. you know, they could be spread wide or something. A priest is saying, you want to copy that text. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure, so sure. he had he had um, uh, Bibles made and sent out to some of his bishoprics okay. um, with a preface on it that said, "I'm trying to reinstitute this." Um, or I'm sorry, not a Bible. He had uh, the pastoral care from Pope Gregory uh, written out and sent to people. Okay, and uh, saying basically, take this, read it, and and spread the word of it because it's important and it's about how to deal with your pasture right? Pastoral care, like the farms, Oh wow! um, things like that. And it's just very high flute in language. And he goes, nobody knows how to read and write anymore. Even the people who are supposed to, right? especially in Latin learning. So we need to get back into this. So use this as a lever to, to teach the masses basically. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this is in lieu of ever having a university. You don't have a big, you don't have like a big power yeah, no. of things like here. We all want to go to, well, not all, but a lot of people <laughs> want to go to college yeah. after they get, cause they want to continue that learning and get to where they can actually like yeah, and they feel, feel they like need a degree and right. to be an expert and things like that. So, so yeah. who who is a scientist and a mathematician? Are these people kind of like uh, um, da Vin- like Da Vinci, where you would have been a man? You'd have to be a, a man of all trades because you can't really yeah. make money as a scientist or no, a math no, teacher, not at all. right? Okay, so you're um, learning this more or less on your own. This is on times. your own. Wow. Yeah, uh, that and Bede, who we mentioned earlier, sure. um, he could be considered 
not just a monk um, and not just an exegete, another fancy term, which just means um, studying religion. Okay. Um, and exegete. not just studying, hmm. but also commenting on okay. uh, religious texts um, and a historian, but he was also a computist. Okay. Um, kind of the predecessor to a statistician. Right. Um, and that's how he was able to figure out the Easter thing. Okay. That was his computist Using side. like an abacus and shit and stars. Like Something like that. Something, he, sure. he had tables, he had right. diagrams, all right. this crazy stuff that makes no sense to me. Um, but yeah, later on, um, Chaucer had a whole treatise about the astrolabe, which is a, a scientific uh, thing that's used for studying the stars. Sure. Okay. I've heard right? of an astrolabe. Okay. Um, and I think he even called his kids something like astrolabe, something like that. Um, it, Astrid. I could see that. Yeah. Okay. Astrolabe. I see where you're going it's with just that. such a weird name. Um, but so there was the treatise on that. So science was becoming prevalent. Right. It and being written down. And being written down. It just wasn't what we think of it now. Right. Which, and if we can circle back to the very, very beginning, when I said, don't use the term dark ages. Okay. Here's the reason why. It's because we had folks like the Venerable Bede, and we had hagiographers like Alfred, and we had all these folks and and um, King Alfred who's working to educate people and to make things better. So understanding the value of knowledge. Value of knowledge. When you say dark ages, you just get this idea of like people lived in darkness yeah. and muck and, and club each other and yeah. steal each other's wives. This or something. isn't like caveman days, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. right? Um, which I'm sure, you know, paleontologists are just gonna be like, no. Sure. Well, there's <laughs> like a, probably this big fuzzy gray area between that transition. Right. You know what I mean? So I get that. Yeah. So we can't call it the dark ages because that means that during this whole period, people think there's no learning, there's no advancement, there's sure. nothing going on. But they on. couldn't have gotten to this medieval age without having some form of learning, even if it was auditory right. before it was written down. And right. Stuff like that. Yeah. So even, you know, coming from what they had and then throughout this course of 1100 years, it's not like people were just idiots and didn't do anything. They just right. walked around like zombies. Right. It was things were advancing. We just happened to now have a period after that called the Renaissance, right. right? Which we don't really call it anymore. It's the early modern period sure. where, you know, and they say Renaissance, well, that's the, that's the enlightenment. That's right. the reinvention of learning. Sure. No, <laughs> there was learning. There sure. was education. But there on was a timeline, advancement. on a timeline measuring, uh, impact. I'm sure that's where they kind of started is like when it was very uh, easy to see that that was happening, mm -hmm. right? Like the yeah. and stuff like that. I could see that. I mean, now, like how they're looking at it. As if the we looked at like 10 years ago from now, yeah. we see, holy crap, it's so different, right? right? 2009 to 2019, totally different technology is crazy sure. advanced people's now. habits are totally different the right. whole bit sure. that might have just taken a few hundred years right. in the middle ages sure not that advancements didn't happen they just happened more slowly right and they talk about how the internet has essentially raised our, our iq as humanity because iq is essentially that you can answer any question you want you don't necessarily have to have the knowledge in your head mm -hmm. so the fact that you know how to get you to know that, how to get to it right your your iq is higher because you can essentially come up with any answer of any question mm -hmm. almost right so yeah. that's that, that's interesting that you uh, that that is where you zeroed in on when I asked you that question. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, being an educator and right. teaching for so many years at the college level and then also just being a bibliophile and all that, I just sure. I have to talk about a it. Bibliophile. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, it's gonna take me a little while to get lover. through the intro. She's a bibliophile. <laughs> She's a, you know, I'm also an Anglophile. Doctor, an Anglophile. She's a uh, what was the study of the saints? Hey, geography. Hey, geography. There we go. That as well. You know, I heard a little, we, we touched on Egyptian. Isn't there like Egyptologists? No, I don't know. Oh, no, no. I won't no. claim to be that. No, no definitely not. I'm sure you know more Although about mummies are super cool. Yeah. And canopic right. jars. Oh my God. That is right. the coolest thing I've ever right. heard. I, I've probably seen the mummy about a million times and I didn't know canopic jars are really a thing for, oh, yeah. until like probably a couple years ago. Yeah. I was like, oh, definitely. this is super cool. I'm reading um, this one book about a necromancer. Okay. It's a fiction book. Sure. And it's a modern fiction book. Um, but so he, uh, he just made a quick reference in the story, Johan Cable is the necromancer. Um, he makes a quick reference in the story to this Egyptian mummy that he did some illicit and illegal scientific experiments on. Okay. Um, just, you know, because he could. After the Pope was on trial like three times in a box, <laughs> you, you, it's not surprising me. You're telling me that, you know. Fair enough. Um, so he was making a comment about um, trying to question a mummy. Yeah. Because, you know, as necromancer, you could bring back the dead. The soul or whatever it speaks out. Sure, right. Sure, so sure, you, sure. You, it's the it's the ability to bring back the dead right. or the study of doing so um, for divinity, for right. um, for divining the future. Sure. And so he was just trying to question a mummy okay. that had been dead for centuries and centuries. And he's just like, well, all this mummy wanted to talk about was freaking like infrastructure and these damn pyramid building. <laughs> but that makes sense because... 
because his brain was probably in a canopic jar somewhere like hundreds of miles away. So that makes sense. <laughs> that totally makes sense. That's what I never understood about the mummy. Like, how's he getting around before he gets his, his organs back? You know, yeah. like, how are you thinking, bro? Come on. Yeah. It's just yeah. mush. That's what doesn't make sense about zombies either. Right. That's true. So I think I'm down to, I think I've got a couple more questions for you. So, okay. uh, War. I know that that there's a million, there's about 50 million things that we could bring up with that, but were yep. things like, uh, drafting a thing? Like if you were in a certain area, was it just guaranteed you're going to get pulled into a war? Like pretty much. Okay. And, yeah. it, and it's all guys. They didn't really mess with bringing in women. That wasn't yeah, a no. thing. Okay. Women wouldn't have gone to the forefront. Um, I guess they could have chopped their hair off and faked it. Mulanish kind yeah. of thing. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, Arya Stark. Right. Esque. Right. I guess. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, no, it was just men that would, that that would, would go. go to the front lines. And I'm or, sure there was nothing happy about that. Nothing that I couldn't no. think of that would be out of the ordinary with that. I'm, cause I'm, cause I'm guessing that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of technology moved when wars came. Cause that's what happens now. Like the space race. I mean, we, we gained so much stuff and that mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily a war, but it was a civil type of, mm -hmm. of war, like an arms race almost, mm -hmm. you know, and every time that we have a war, we seem to progress tons and tons when we, we move forward. How much of that do you feel was the truth back then? Do you feel like wars change things in a way that was permanent every time they happened? The big ones? Yeah, um, probably. I mean, most people who talk about the Middle Ages are going to go to the Crusades. Okay. Um, that was the big deal. Sure. Uh, big, big war. There were other battles and stuff, other wars. Um, I mean, the Norman Conquest was essentially a war right. and it's William of Normandy. Right. I thought of that before and I wanted to, Oh, there it is. See, we make got it. sure that I got it in there. I'm not a complete moron. <laughs> it's William no, you're of not. Normandy. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> that's just like, that's one of those names that you just, you can't forget. Right. Like, you know, Egbert, you could forget because who the hell can remember that? But William of Normandy, I mean, come on. Well, I wouldn't have put together Normandy and the Normans until you said it, you know, I would yeah. have assumed, but I'm like, nah, that's not, that's, that's yep, too easy. You definitely. Know? So. Um, so yeah, they would probably go with, uh, the crusades and I don't personally like talking about the crusades because I think they were, um, they went on too long. Oh, it's Rapscallius. Yeah. And there was... were too many of them. Right. Right. So it was like the first crusade and the second crusade and the third crusade and like the eighth crusade. Right. And it just went on for Well, and then you had the, 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 and it was a pointless battle. Right. Well, you had the Islamic, uh, uh, side of the house, which right. doesn't get enough, you know, they also had their own versions of these crusades. I mean, it just right. kept, it yeah. continued to happen. Yeah. But I feel like in a lot of ways you don't have that massing of resources and push to get some, an edge over the next, uh, you know, set of humans as yeah. you do in a war, you know, and that seems to always be where you see these huge technology boosts, you know. I think the biggest thing that the Crusades did was just reduce the population. Sure. I th that, sure, if sure. anything, that was an advancement. It was just a reduction right. of a population that might be getting out of hand. I always wonder if we had been more pacifist as, as, as a culture, uh, uh, you know, speaking to like going back before the Crusades became a thing, mm -hmm. you know, how, how much different would it have been if we hadn't pushed, uh, pushed culture around like that? You know what I mean? Mm, would it yeah. have been more siloed? Would it have been harder would there have been bigger wars in the future because nobody had ever met each other but with the crusades you're crisscrossing boundaries for no yeah, reason except absolutely. for to just this is my religion take it you know what i mean mm -hmm. if you don't i'll kill you, you yeah know? yeah so. pretty much um, i mean i think a lot of people would have been isolated a lot of cultures would have ended up being isolated okay as much as wars suck it also allows us to see culture sure um that we wouldn't otherwise really right know anything and not about. necessarily in a good way and but. not not always in a good way yeah um but even with our modern wars um before we entered iraq or afghanistan or iran we may not have as just like a normal person i right. wouldn't have known very much at all about I'll iraq or i'll tell you september 11th like i thought like how, how are we not just wiping this country out and i was I uh, was in eighth grade. Yeah. So when that happened, uh, all I could think of was this hate and like almost this, this mob mentality, which I think a lot of people did. But now that I've grown and the, the, that war has come more or less, more or less to pass, um, you start to see that there's a lot of normal people there, just like yeah. you and I, and they're caught up in shit that we're just sitting here talking about, about the yeah. medieval ages. And you could have gotten roped into this thing, but just because you're an Iranian or an Iraqi, you know, citizen, uh, you know, an idiotic American may call you out. You know what I mean? Yep. Not knowing that you're just this peaceful cat that goes and, you know, yeah, it's just trying to build video living. games in a, in an office building in Iraq, whatever, yeah. you know, like yeah, uh, just trying to, to make your way daily basis. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. How did the, was was fitness a thing in the Middle Ages? Was that a thing? Because like I feel like you're working, and it's probably not a thing. But no, like, not, that, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, sporting 
was a okay. thing. Okay. Okay. So sports was around. So not in our typical, like they didn't have like soccer, right? right? Or things like that. Football. And shit <laughs> yeah. Like that. Footballing. Yeah. Um, and they, they certainly would have, wouldn't have gone to the gym and like lifted weights. Right. Right. Or run on a treadmill. They sure. would have been like, oh my God, why? <laughs> why would I do that? I'm so tired. Sir, I've don't you have the, a horse? <laughs> I've been working the field for the last 14 hours. Why right. would I want to do that? Sure. Um, also like look at the guns on me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, but as far as like um, sporting is mm. concerned, mm. yeah, they would have gone on like fox hunts. Okay. Um, and in fact, in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, part of it talks about um, the, he's not a king, but he's a, a lord or something that Sir Gowan stays with on his journey to the Green Knight. Um, and he goes out hunting every day okay. and for three days. And so huh. that was kind of a sport sure. for them was hunting and, um, catching a deer or catching a boar or trying to catch a fox. Sure. Sure. Right. So that kind of thing, I guess you could kind of consider to be like athleticism because it's almost sport. not for survival. They're doing it more for kind of like pleasure. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. they're going to eat what they catch. Okay. Um, because why wouldn't you, but if they didn't catch anything, they're not going to starve. To they're death. not going to starve. To so death. it could be considered recreation almost yeah yeah okay. it could definitely be con considered like our typical hunting sure only we're gonna they're gonna use everything right. that they catch sure and they don't have the kind of time to be able to everybody's watching like the basketball games tonight and stuff no. uh, right okay that told i i guess that yeah, that no. kind of retrained how i thought about that that kind sure. of entertainment value would have been like the the poets and stuff or right the um, theater type stuff yeah so okay. like so people who were doing entertaining uh mm. juggling right and those kinds of things that would have been maybe another type of fitnessy sport type deal sure yeah yeah i would think juggling for like hours on end would wear me out <laughs> yeah yeah you know or trying to think of poetry for endless hours to right. entertain your king don't forget yeah but don't you forget make, you could make up so much shit because oh, nobody really could check on you you know yeah. that's like it's awesome i could totally yeah. of course like i talk like fuck so i could totally see me being that guy <laughs> you know just, like, just pay me and i'll tell you stories all day what do you want to know you yeah, know absolutely just make shit up Anything, so what, what do you, if, uh, I realize that we're not representing a brand or something here, but yeah. do you have anything published that, that we, somebody could, could, if they were interested in looking at some of your writing? I, um, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, the dissertation has been eating up all my time for the last three years. What about that? Is that going to, when that's done, is that going to be published somewhere? That will be, um, it will be published as far as a dissertation is concerned. Okay. So if you have access to uh, like the UNM databases through the library, okay. uh, you can look up dissertations right. through there. Right. Anybody, anybody not from here, UNM's University of New Mexico. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Most people are from here, but I'm right, just, you know. Yeah. So uh, any, pretty much wherever you go for your university degree, but um, like the peer review that. database type type stuff, right? Cause you get access to a peer yep. review database and yeah, that's what you're yeah, going to yeah. be. And they can look you up by your name, Jessica Troy, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, they can cool. do that. Um, and then eventually um, my dissertation will hopefully be turned into my first book. Oh, um, that's, I like where you're going with that's this. That's typically what happens okay. is that you turn your dissertation into a monograph okay. manuscript. Um, so some changes happen, some rearranging, some revising, right. but eventually it will become a book, hopefully. And do you have any ideas on names or timelines or we're too early in that? Uh, too early for timeline. Um, it'll probably stick with um, similarly what it's titled, um, which is Calling All Corpses. Ah, I love it. Right here. Give me one of those. <laughs> yes. That is so fitting for it. So, and then there's the, the colon, and then there's that long academic part after it that's sure. like, you know, an examination of the old English literature. And right. Blah, 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 blah. Right. So, it's really long. But Calling All Corpses is what I stuck with. That is super cool. Yeah. So calling all corpses. And if it comes out, you got to keep me in, keep in touch with me I make will, sure. Yeah. And I'll make sure to put it out there and, uh, hopefully like Amazon and stuff like that. It's probably where we're going to go with it. It can be found. Um, most academic books get pretty pricey. Okay. Um, and we don't get anything from it because really? they're academic books. Oh, sure. Um, we might get something, especially not our first monograph. We probably wouldn't get anything from sure. it. Um, that's all through like the publisher okay. and things like that. So it's more like, um, we get props okay. for what we do, our research, sure. that kind of thing. But this helps out because you really just want to be like faculty. You you yeah. want to you want to be a teacher for the rest of your life. Yeah. If there's anybody out there who's part of a university who's like hiring a medievalist, for the love of God, please call me. So they don't <laughs> or have email one, me or something. They don't have one at UNM. 
Um, they don't have well, a spot for it. We don't have a spot. Ah, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, so, so it's if there's any openings. Sure. Uh, for an Anglo-Saxonist who really talks about corpses a right. lot. Um, but I can do, I've taught literature. I've taught um, any range of early British lit all sure. the way up to, I think like the 1800s. Um, so I can do it all. And, right. and my students usually have, a well, she's holding time. a dog this whole time, just right <laughs> off the top of her head. So she knows what she's talking about. I promise you guys, how would somebody get in touch with you? Um, so they can email me at, um, either my UNM email address, which is, um, my name, J Troy zero okay. one at UNM.edu. Okay. Or I have a Gmail account as well. That is, um, also partly my name, J E Troy eight okay. four at gmail.com. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I think, uh, I think, uh, people are going to be super interested to see like some more middle ages stuff. And I think the more that you keep putting out, it'd be yeah. really cool to see. I, you need like an Instagram with like some little stories, you know, I think that would be cool. Cause I, <laughs> I do have an Instagram. Do you? Okay. I do. Um, it's not always medieval though. Okay. I can't promise that. Um, I'm at corpse lady 84. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> so, you just need a metal band behind you doing all this. I know. I need like work. a metal soundtrack. I gotta, I gotta get off. I'm a metal head though. I can't get off the, the I'm okay with that. Anytime it goes corpses and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, anything else you want to tell the audience before we get off the off the horn here? Um, I guess I could say don't have a prejudice against old literature. Okay. Um, a lot of people do that. They hear even Shakespeare or something like that. Um, but just because it's old doesn't mean it's not cool. Yeah. Because, I mean, I hope from the things that I've brought up here, you can see it's pretty cool. Right. We have talking corpses. We have revived we do saint erkenwald ran into a talking corpse wow um well and the birds were like different story. cool in some of those stories yeah, some of the history and- even you know bringing cuthbert his his food and otters cooling his feet and- but i like i like how you you are looking for something in these and i think people need yeah. to find that like they like you're into corpses maybe yeah. somebody like myself i'm into fitness quite a bit so sure. i'd be interested to see like what you know maybe not like the gladiator stuff, but like you said, like some of the Tournaments hunting and stuff. and knights. And yeah. So there's always like that, yeah. a mix of things in a lot of these literature, this literature that you're talking about, right? Yeah, for okay. sure. Okay. You know, and people are coming up from hell and, um, <laughs> another, uh, Arthur story, another Arthurian story, the adventures of Arthur. Okay. Um, he goes off hunting and his, um, his wife, Guinevere right. is, uh, she sticks with Gowan uh, one of the nights and they hang by this lake while he goes hunting. And she's like, yeah, I don't care. Go hunting. And so they're hanging around. And all of a sudden from the middle of this lake is this like fiery thing, the plume that comes up from the middle of the lake. And they're like, holy crap, what's happening? And um, eventually they see that there's a figure that's forming, that's coming out of the lake. And um, automatically some people might be thinking, oh, lady of the lake, Excalibur, right. things right. like that. No, definitely not. This is um, a dead person coming up from hell who is covered in like frogs and snakes and black slithery things. And just pick this time to do it. It's because it ends up, spoiler alert, it's Guinevere's mother. Oh, wow. Who has been dead huh. and has a warning for her daughter that if you don't change your ways, you're going to end up like me wow. in hell. By the way, pray for me so I get out of hell. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thanks, mom. Yeah, good. right. Good Thank talk. You. <laughs> um, so just because it's old doesn't mean there aren't cool things in it. That you can glean from it. That you can glean from it. Whatever you think is cool. Yeah. You know, if you want to talk about feminist stuff. There are strong women. If you want to talk about LGBTQ stuff, there are some things that you can interpret as being, um, you know, gay or queer or whatever you want to think about. I didn't cover that, but I I figured that was kind of straightforward. Like that wasn't a thing back then. You weren't going to come out as gay and expect to be treated normally, right? Yeah, not so much, but um, it, it was definitely a closed door. Right. Policy? I mean, gay people have always been here since the dawn of man. It's just yeah. a matter of how it was viewed and accepted in society. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like the characterization. Mm. You could interpret some of these characters in different ways. Right. And say like, well, that was a very homoerotic situation. Sure. It just didn't always seem that right. way. Like right. because you're married, it was almost assumed even if you acted kind of uh, what could be considered sort of gay or feminine, mm-hmm. you, you would always be given that pass because you're like you're married, right? Because yeah, you hear about much, like yeah. kings that could get married and even though they may swing the the same sex way uh mm-hmm. they they can look like a king and queen situation just yeah, fine absolutely would be messing around with servants or whatever they do yeah i mean things you know. behind closed doors didn't get written down sure. so sure. you know there's that there's disability theory studies right. there you know whatever your your favorite thing is i mean i found corpses it. yeah right it's you can find it in these old stories just don't have a prejudice against it right it might be tough to slog through some religious like stuff. Like the scarlet letter dude. That, 
<laughs> it's not even any of the subject matter. It's just like, I'm like literally holding a dictionary. Like, what the fuck? Why can't you just say like grass instead of like whatever <laughs> the hell word is here? That's one of the reasons I don't like Dickens. Um, okay. Is because yeah. he's so damn long winded. Right. And I understand. All right. Maybe you got paid by the word or your, your manuscript came out in pieces. Right. And so you wanted it to be as long as possible. We're talking about Moby Dick, right? The, no, that's no. Melville. Okay. Uh, okay. Charles okay. Dickens, I'm sorry. I'm Tale sorry. Of Two Cities. You can tell how, how versed I am in the, the authors here. That's my bad. Okay. <laughs> no, no okay. worries. Even I was, I was going to say, cause Moby Dick was even a little bit long winded, even though that oh, was yeah. very recent comparatively to a lot of this stuff. Like yeah. uh, he was very long winded. I like his ex- explanation of food though. I've never wanted clam chowder so bad from like a Victorian <laughs> book. I was like, mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't really like things like Charles Dickens, right? right. Um, I, like I said, there are some authors that I just can't read. Yeah. They're just too lengthy. Right. I they think it could be said with any subject though. And it can you know be said I mean? with anything. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, of course I love Poe and, and HP Lovecraft right. and all those horror authors and things like that. But even those you can interpret in different ways. Sure. You know, sure, sure. Yeah. You were saying beforehand, you're a big serial killer fan. So. Yeah. Yeah. Those are cool. <laughs> you know, even just, even the old ones, Jack the Ripper and the mystery behind right. Jack the Ripper and who he really was. And if he ever came to America, right. which there is a theory that he did come to America. There's so many theories. H.H. H. Holmes. Um, but the timeline doesn't quite yes. match. I did, I did read, uh, um, um, devil in the white city. Yeah. Yes. That's did you a read great that? One. Yes. That yeah. book is so good. That's a great story. And I would never think I'd be so interested in the stupid Chicago world's fair, but <laughs> it's so cool to like hear him cut back and forth between like historical truth and then like mostly truth, but he did fictionalize a bit of it. Not sure, necessarily. Yeah. It wasn't like he didn't Hollywoodize it, but he like the scene where he kills one of the, the women with the, uh, What's the stuff they breathe and they, they pass out? Uh, oh, like chloroform. Uh, chloroform, let's yeah. say formaldehyde. That, that was fictionalized. Like he wrote out what would be an interpretation of a scenario, you know, but right, th- sure. those types of books, man, like uh, I'll have to find me one that's kind of like medieval, you know, more so than the, cause that was late 1800s. Yeah. You know, you yeah. got any good recommendations? What's a good book that a layman might be able to get into? It's not super high, high level. That's language. medieval too, or just medieval general? too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say medieval, but not necessarily around a serial killer, but what's, um, what's like a good entry book that somebody listening would be like, you know, to get into maybe some medieval stuff. If you didn't want to go academic, um, because those are, those can be very dry. Right. Um, I like them, but they can be very dry even for me. Right. Um, I mentioned book of the maidservant, okay. um, by Rebecca Barnhouse. Okay. That's a really cool one. Okay. She also had two others that are Beowulf oriented. Okay. Um, one of them is called coming of the dragon. Hmm. And I can't remember the third one, um, but <laughs> just Google her, Google that on or Amazon it, whatever. Um, so those are pretty cool. Um, the song of Roland is actually pretty cool. Okay. Um, and that's a, that is a medieval story. Um, even just reading translations of some later medieval stuff. Um, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is a really cool story. Okay. Um, don't read the, the original in middle English because it is a little hard. Right. Um, but get a translation and you, I mean, a guy gets his head chopped off, picks it up and keeps talking. Wow. Like picks up his own head and keeps talking <laughs> and then challenges Gowan to do the same thing, to have the same thing done to him a year later. Sir, please have him chop your head off as well. <laughs> yeah, essentially, he comes rolling in on a horse into King Arthur's court and says, I want someone to chop my head off. Wow. No, what like, a story. What? Yeah. Are you insane? Right. You know, and so Gowan gets up, does it, expecting it to be done to go back to the feast. And this is on Christmas, by the okay. way. Um, so it's not just King Arthur's house. It's also Christmas at right. King Arthur's house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then he picks up his own head, puts it back on and says, okay, see you in a year. Come <laughs> find me. Huh. And so Gowan in a year has to take a journey um, to find the Green Knight. Huh. And to find Sir Gowan his, and the Green Knight. Okay. Green okay. Chapel. okay. Yeah. So this and is story. so that's his. The, it's a I'll try that one. I'll read that one. I'll quest. get back to you. I'm, I'm game to read that one. Yeah. Read okay. that one. Okay. I think it's pretty cool. I'll Beowulf start there. is a little long. Okay. Um, over 3,000 lines. Okay. But it does have to do with monsters. Sure. So slog through the beginning genealogy crap. Nobody cares about right. it. Right. That's like the beginning of The Lord of the Rings. I want to shoot myself. <laughs> it's very they just long. Talk about the yeah. son of the son of. Yeah. And that comes directly from the Middle Ages. Really? Like, okay. They did that. Beowulf does that. They do that in the beginning of the 13th Warrior. One you can't miss. Okay. He, yeah, he, yeah. He, he explains his lineage like real quick. And then they just, he keeps saying son of, and I guess the, I'm probably enunciating it wrong, but he says Eben, mm. and which means son of, I guess. Okay. So they all call him Eben. And he's like, that's not my name. He was saying, <laughs> I'm the son of, son of, son of, you know, Eben, son of, even son of, even, you know, the, right, right, the right. different names. So they call him Eben. And he's like, oh. 
you know, but he's like Arab, which I think is interesting. Like right. he's an so outsider that in that storyline, you know, yeah. so it's, it's kind of interesting. Okay. So, yeah. so those are some books to check out and yeah. just get out there and get interested in your middle ages, folks. Come yeah, on. Absolutely. Know our history. I, I would never have known those, you know, you think of a lot of England and a lot of the history and movies that are made. It's past a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And you don't know the influences so. that created the, the great Britain, great Britain, or what is England. England and then yeah. the, you know, the sisters, Scotland and, and Ireland up there, you mm -hmm. know, so that's very cool. I think this has been a super cool podcast. I really appreciate you coming on. Good. I'm glad. Um, I know talking about history and literature can be, can seem boring. Um, but you did good I, though. I think you did good. I love it. Yeah. And so I think that comes through even in my classes. Like people always tell me you're super passionate. You are it super comes passionate. Through, Absolutely. You know, especially when I could talk about dead things. That's when I right. get really excited about it. Well, not necessarily because you talk about dead things, but that's why I brought you on. Because yeah. I could tell you were passionate and I'd never even met you before, yeah, but I was sure. like, you know what? I'm, a, I'm stalking her on Facebook and all she said, <laughs> no, and all, the only thing that caught my eye right off the bat, I was like masters of medieval studies. And I was like, oh, who is this? I was like, <laughs> I hope you're from here because I, I, I hate doing these over Skype because it's, yeah, it's much yeah, more fun sure. to do them in person, you know? Sure. So, well, thank you for having me. You have a very beautiful house. Yeah. Thank you and, for coming. And I look forward to reading some more of your, your books. We're going to put an S there because I yeah. feel like you're going to have oh, more to so. come. Yeah, for so, sure. And if you guys have haven't, lots of ideas. if you guys have any needs for a medievalist, make sure you hit her up at those, please, those email addresses please, please. she left out there. <laughs> I love teaching. Let right. me do what I love to do. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.